in the Senate of the United States a resolution to establish a select committee of the Senate to conduct an investigation and study of the extent, if any, to which illegal, improper, or unethical activities were engaged in by any persons acting individually or in combination with others in the presidential election of 1972 or any campaign, canvas, or other activity related to it. From Washington, NPAC brings you gavel-to-gavel videotape coverage of today's hearings by the Senate Select Committee on Presidential Campaign Activities. Here is NPAC senior correspondent Robert McNeil. Good evening. Another round of Watergate hearings ended today with fresh and moving insights into the apparent motivation of men prepared to disregard the law because of the depth of their loyalty to President Nixon. You will see tonight a very unusual spectacle, a man admitting that he voluntarily committed perjury, an act for which he could still be indicted to cover up the connection between Watergate and the Nixon re-election campaign. The witness was Herbert Porter, scheduling director of the re-election committee, who paid out some of the funds used by G. Gordon Liddy. His testimony raised again one of the main underlying themes of this investigation, how the morality of election campaigns can be determined. The fallout of Watergate continues to range far from the Senate caucus room. At the White House today, Clarence Kelly, chief of the Kansas City Police Department, was nominated to head the FBI. The previous White House choice, L. Patrick Gray, was forced to quit in April because of his handling of the Watergate probe. Kelly himself is a former FBI agent. The FBI will continue to be led by William Ruckelshaus until Kelly is confirmed by the Senate. The Bureau has been without permanent leadership since J. Edgar Hoover died in May 1972. And in the courts today, the deposition of former White House Chief of Staff H.R. Haldeman was made public, and it held some surprises. Haldeman says former White House Counsel John Dean was never asked formally to investigate White House staff involvement in the Watergate break-in and never submitted a report on the topic. In fact, said Haldeman, Dean didn't talk directly about the situation with President Nixon until 1973. This confirms Dean's recollection that he was flabbergasted when he heard the President announce last August that he, Dean, had investigated the situation and reported to him, the President, that there had been no involvement of White House aides. Haldeman also admitted that he had controlled a $350,000 fund that was used to finance polling during the campaign. The deposition filed as part of the Democratic suit against the committee to re-elect the president is more than 200 pages long, and it will probably be another day at least before it's fully digested. As you will see, Jeb Stuart Magruder has been moved squarely and permanently into the very hot X-ray lights of the Senate Watergate Committee, and Magruder himself is yet to be heard from. But today, Hugh Sloan took some final licks at his former associate at the committee to re-elect the president, and then another former campaign official, Herbert Porter, added even more to the growing Magruder file. Sloan said yesterday, and repeated today, that Magruder urged him to lie to authorities about the amount of money given to G. Gordon Liddy, and Sloan refused. Now, Herbert Porter's tale was similar, only the ending was different. Porter said Magruder asked him to tell a false story to the FBI, the grand jury, and a trial court. Porter went along with the suggestion from Magruder, number two campaign boss under John Mitchell, and a man Porter trusted. He said, um, would you be willing, if I made that statement to the federal, or to the FBI, would you be willing to corroborate that when I came to you in December and asked you how much it would cost, that that's what you said? That was the net effect of his question. That was the net of his question. And uh, I thought for a moment, and I, I said, yes, I, I probably would do that. Later, did you tell the FBI what Mr. Magruder asked you to tell them? Yes, sir, I did. And subsequent to that, did you appear at a federal, before a federal grand jury? Yes, sir. And uh, were you asked about the surrogate candidate program? Yes, sir. And what did you tell the federal grand jury? Same thing, sir. And were you a witness at the trial of the seven defendants who were indicted in the Watergate case? Yes, sir. And did you give the same accounts? Yes, sir, I did. Later, Porter goes on to discuss the mental set that persuaded him to go along with this scheme. But his admission of perjury before a national audience today was certainly one of the most dramatic moments of the hearings so far. David Ostern, professor at law at Georgetown University Law School, watched the hearings with us today, 
David, what especially would you advise people to look for this evening in the testimony? Well, Robin, Sloan is nothing short of a great witness. He, uh, he is confident, and honesty and integrity and candor just flow from him. And I mention that because when I was trying cases actively, people would sometimes say, who were going to be prospective witnesses, how should I act in front of the jury? Well, I'm not sure I can answer that, but watch Sloan, because if anyone is ever going to testify, he is a, a good example of what to do, uh, particularly when he is pinned down as to exact words that are spoken in conversations that took place a long time ago. He is very frank and candid to say he is not sure of the exact words. Contrasted from Porter, who when he testifies, people will hear that he has an amazing memory, and it would appear that he can remember the exact words that were spoken. Incidentally, uh, Sloan would be a much harder witness to cross-examine, and you might think of the kinds of questions you would want to ask him. Uh, he would be very hard to ask specific questions to, because his memory is the memory of a very honest man who cannot, who cannot remember the exact details. And finally, toward the end, when Mr. Porter is testifying again, I am afraid that people will once again hear the legal profession come in for some criticism, even to one attorney who apparently went to sleep while his client was consulting him. Mr. Austin, we'll talk about that more at the, uh, at the end of, the, of tonight's replay. Also, at the conclusion tonight, we'll have an interview that uh, Peter Kay did after the conclusion of the session today with Senator Inouye of Hawaii. As you plan your viewing tonight, you might keep in mind that today's most dramatic testimony and the sharpest questioning by Senator Baker, as it happened, came in the latter part of the evening. Here is an hour-by-hour -hour guide to the hearings. In the first hour, former campaign treasurer Hugh Sloan is questioned about possible tax dodges used in raising funds. Under further questioning, he says he remains loyal to the president, despite policy differences in the campaign. When nothing came of his resignation from the re-election committee, Sloan says he felt, I had essentially lost on the cover-up issue. In hour number two, Sloan testifies that he got no guidance on what to tell the FBI, either from John Mitchell or Mitchell's deputy, Robert Mardian. He adds that he singled out Magruder for criticism because Magruder was the only one who asked him to do anything illegal. In the third hour tonight, Herbert Porter tells the committee that he did make a false statement to the FBI, grand jury, and before the jury trying the Watergate conspirators. Porter says he agreed to back up Magruder's incorrect version of where the money went. Instead of telling how much went to Gordon Liddy, he agreed to say $100,000 went to pay for protecting surrogates who campaigned on Nixon's behalf. In the final hour, Porter admits that on instructions from Magruder, he hired two pranksters to harass Democratic candidates. Under questioning from Senator Baker, Porter says he was aware that documents his secretary copied were stolen documents. So, that is tonight's agenda. And there is Committee Chairman Sam Irvin the committee gaveling the session has, open. We'll come to order. The New York Times and the Washington Post carry news dispatches indicating that uh, papers identified as the so-called lean papers have been uh, leased in some manner to the New York Times and published in part in the New York Times. When uh, Judge Sirico ordered a copy of these, of the, of, I don't know whether the same papers, but the indications are that they are, ordered a copy of the papers which uh, Mr. Dean allegedly carried from the White House and placed in a safe deposit box and later surrendered to Judge Sirica, be furnished to this committee. I have a very wise man for vice chairman of this committee. Despite his youthful appearance, he has the wisdom of the ages. <laughs> and he suggested to me when the, the papers were received that we uh, deposit them in the uh, in a secure place under the most watchful security officer. And I'm happy to report that an investigation made uh, this morning indicates that these papers have, that any release that may have been made to the press of any papers 
of this na nature would not, did not come from this committee. These uh, papers were deposited with, under the understanding they'd be kept secure, that no one would have access to them except the senators who constitute members of this committee, and that, even no, and that no member of this committee would make any notes in respect to those papers. So I'm glad to be able to report that, uh, however, the New York Times may have gotten copies of any papers of that nature that uh, they did not come from this committee or from copies of uh, the copy deposited with this committee by, uh, under the order of Judge Sirico. Now, I'd be glad to have uh, my wise colleague to uh, make a statement on this point. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. Whatever wisdom I have in that respect, I learned from you. But anyway, I think it might be of some interest to know how we provided for the security of these documents. Judge Sirica's order, a certified copy of which was delivered to us, provided that the documents would be delivered to the chairman and vice chairman for disposition as they directed. Senator Irvin and I, in accommodation of that suggestion by Judge Sirica, conferred on how best to provide for the security of documents that were classified at a very high level. I am also a member of the Joint Committee on Atomic Energy. The Joint Committee on Atomic Energy has the highest security uh, custodial facilities. The committee permitted us then to provide for separate storage of those documents in a separate safe under the direction of the security officer of the Joint Committee on Atomic Energy. In a secure, secure area, protected 24 hours of the day by guards, protected by automatic detection systems, protected by other devices that I believe virtually guarantee that there would not be intrusion into that area. No one has seen those documents except the members of this committee plus the chief counsel and the minority counsel. No one has taken those documents out of a secure area. Those documents are still in a secure area. It's a matter of some pride, I believe, that the Joint Committee on Atomic Energy, since its, since its instigation, since its beginning, has never had a security leak. And I'm sure this does not constitute an exception to the rule. I don't know does any other member of the committee desire to make any statement this before we resume the question of the witness. Then uh, Senator Honore will resume the question of the witness. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Sloan, I gather from the testimony yesterday that you have been involved in raising funds, political funds, since 1965. Is that correct? Yes, sir, that is correct. Uh, I would gather that uh, this would qualify you as an expert in political fundraising. I'm not sure anybody really becomes an expert in this area, Senator. <laughs> I gather also from the testimony yesterday that... Uh, you were a member of the Budget Committee? Yes, sir, that is correct. Who were the other members of this committee? Uh, to my best recollection, it was Mr. John Mitchell, Mr. Maurice Stans, uh, myself, Mr. Lee Nunn, the Vice Chairman of the Finance Committee, uh, Mr. Jeb Magruder, and Mr. Fred Malik. Also, Mr. Rob Odell uh, participated in those meetings uh, in the form of keeping the notes of uh, changes and so forth as we proceeded through budget reviews. He would uh, take that information, recollate it, uh, revise it, and provide the working papers for any subsequent meeting. Would you uh, call this a high echelon policy committee? Yes, sir. Now, did this committee uh, decide upon uh, how funds were to be spent? Yes, sir. The it really had a, a dual function, uh, which is the reason for the joint representation, essentially, of the political members and the finance members. The finance input, essentially, into budget committee meetings would be to indicate at any particular point in time 
what our best estimates might be of what we realistically felt we could raise in terms of funds for the total effort. Uh, we also had a responsibility in providing a bu detailed budget for our own operating overhead for the Finance Committee as one of the items considered in these meetings. The political committee essentially working with the guidelines we gave them, for instance, if you're talking about a, a $40 million campaign, uh, each of the various divisions would begin the process by indicating the tasks they want to accomplish and how much they thought it would cost. The, the process within these meetings would be to review these in total, and the totals might come in at $60 million, and the subsequent discussions would generally be along the lines of uh, where do you cut, where do we establish our priorities, how do we get all these individual budgets of departments and divisions down so they fall within the ceilings set by the Finance Committee in terms of total dollars expected to be raised. We subsequently were in the process, uh, which we had not completed at the time I left, of setting up a, a monitoring function where we would report back to the various divisions on essentially a monthly basis as to how they were doing uh, versus the, the funds they were allowed uh, within their budgets. And so in your budget committee discussions, you discuss the purposes for which uh, these funds were to be used. In broad categories, it would be, uh, uh, for instance, uh, in considering the advertising budget, the uh, uh, members of that department would come in essentially and make a presentation and say, uh, our judgment is we should uh, allocate 60 percent of this money for television, 10 uh, percent for radio, uh, and so forth. But generally, to these kind of dimensions, uh, there would often be discussion of whether that is the proper allegation. Uh, allocation uh, in terms of percentages and so forth. I would, would the disbursement of a million dollars uh, qualify for discussion in these meetings? I believe it should have. I never heard any of these funds uh, listed here ever discussed in any budget meeting. Did you ever discuss uh, clandestine activities? No, sir. I never heard any such discussion. Was it the practice of your budget committee to dispense $350,000 or $1.7 million, .7 million uh, without your knowing what the purpose was to be? As I indicated, Senator, uh, these funds and the uh, authority uh, that was set up to disperse them was never a subject of any budget committee meeting in which I sat. I did not sit in all of them. And you just took it on face value that uh, it was to be spent for legal purpose? Absolutely. Never got suspicious? Not at the time I was doing it, certainly uh, following June 17th, yes, sir. Did your office, the White House, and the Internal Revenue Service ever get together to discuss how the laws of the United States, the tax laws of the United States, could be... Uh, skirted to uh, raise funds such as, or for example, avoiding payment of capital gains taxes? Uh, there were discussions, uh, uh, not sure quite in the context uh, you presented it, Senator, uh, uh, opinions on the subject of capital gains liability were sought from various legal sources independent as well as I believe there were opinions probably from counsel in the White House at early stages since we did not have a full-time counsel ourselves. Uh, with regard to uh, other matters, for instance, the, the gift tax liability to donors, I believe uh, both our party as well as the Democratic Party uh, were urging, uh, I believe cooperatively, uh, an attempt to reverse the decision, to get some kind of a decision that would do away from uh, the necessity of these multiple committees, which are a real headache and nightmare for people involved in the mechanical end of fundraising. What about, uh, I, I have here a draft letter prepared by Mr. Thomas Pike, co-chairman of the California Committee to Re-elect the President. It's a draft letter which is addressed to you, sir. And uh, it's a form letter that one would fill out when he uh, wishes to contribute stocks and securities. Yes, sir. 
Did you receive any stocks and securities? Yes, sir. We received a uh, very large proportion, particularly in the pre-April 7th period, of uh, our receipts uh, in form of securities. What was the scheme, sir? Excuse me, sir? What was the scheme involved? The scheme, sir? Yes. Uh, I don't believe there was any scheme. I think it, in terms of fundraising, uh, uh, anything that is uh, of value essentially can be accepted into a campaign. Uh, securities, as far as I know, and certainly not in the magnitude or, or the quantity that exists in normally in a presidential campaign, have been handled uh, by finance committees uh, regularly. For instance, when I was in the Republican uh, National Committee, uh, there would be contributions in the form of securities. What was the magnitude of the funds received through this means? I would be uh, guessing, but I would, I would say probably a, a third, maybe more. $20 million worth? No, sir. That would be the, the – I'm not familiar with the receipts uh, following June. The, the period I'm really familiar with is the, the $20 million we raised uh, essentially from March of 71 uh, up through the April 7th period. I would say a third of that figure probably would have been in securities. Was this a scheme where one buys stocks, say, 10 years ago at 10, and the value is now 50, and you get it for 50, and the donor doesn't have to pay any tax on it? Uh, I, I don't believe it's a, a, a scheme, Senator. Uh, the uh, Other Americans have to pay taxes, don't they? Well, the, I'm not a, a tax expert. The legal opinions we had under which I was operating essentially said that in turning the, the securities over, in other words, not cashing the securities, if the, if the individual had cashed the securities himself, he obviously had a capital gains liability. But in making the gift in the form of securities, that liability did not go back to the donor. The legal opinion as to the status of the committee, uh, which I understood we were operating under, and there were, I believe, there are legal opinions uh, in the files of the committee supporting this was that the committee essentially is like uh, is a, a non-profit organization in the sense that it's not a money-making business and at the conclusion of a campaign all its assets essentially are liquidated. I have with me a copy of a GAO report dated May the 20th <coughs> and in this report you've listed several cash disbursements. However, I noticed that uh, the cash disbursement which is noted on this board to Mr. Lankler is not listed in the GAO report. Uh, could you tell the committee why you did not advise the GAO as to the $50,000 cash disbursement to Mr. Lankler? Yes, sir. I, at the time I was giving the information that's contained in that report, I did not recall that particular transaction or I believe a number of other ones. This has been a, an attempt over a period of time with the General Accounting Office from memory to try to reconstruct what, in fact, has happened. Uh, the Lankler transaction and one or two others were brought to our attention, uh, to my uh, attorney's attention, through another gentleman's what, attorney. What was the purpose of this disbursement? Uh, excuse me, sir? What was the purpose of this cash disbursement to Mr. Lankler? To Mr. Lankler? Yes. Uh, as I understand it, and I'm not uh, totally clear as it's not present uh, in the, the earlier periods, but my best recollection of the situation that existed that led to that uh, distribution to Mr. Lankford was that in the, the setting up of our fundraising operations that uh, I believe Secretary Stans had made an arrangement with the fundraisers in Maryland who were working in behalf of the President that all the funds they raised in a certain period would be turned into the national headquarters. In other words, they would not hold out funds for their own operations. Uh, as I understand it, in return for this, there was an understanding that when they had a major undertaking such as the, I believe it was an Agnew dinner in this case, that they would get seed money back from us on a loan basis to uh, run their dinner and that this would be reimbursed to us out of the receipts of the dinner. I gather from yesterday's testimony that uh, as treasurer of this committee, you had listed on one sheet of paper all of the cash disbursements that you had made? Uh, Senator, that uh, 
listing of cash funds uh, that is does not represent a listing of a committee those funds were funds of multiple committees this was merely an internal control over funds that were kept in a physically secure place namely a safe how did you list these cash disbursements or did you record that at all i listed them on the same list of paper by, excuse me, by, by name of the individual to whom the di distributions had been made. And uh, you testified he destroyed the sheet. When did you destroy uh, this? No, sir. Uh, I testified that I destroyed a working book which I had maintained for my own use in maintaining the security of these funds, only with the clear understanding that the final report made from that book in turning it over to Secretary Stans would remain as a permanent record of those transactions. You've just used the phrase maintaining the security of these funds. Were you afraid that these funds may be incriminating? No, sir. My concern was uh, I obviously had a responsibility to keep track of who they were from and who they went out to. It's merely a record of that and also a verification at any time if someone uh, wanted Secretary Stans, for, for instance, wanted to say, okay, let's go count the cash on hand. I want you to be able to substantiate to me that that's all the cash that's supposed to be there. In other words, it was a guarantee, a written record of all transactions. If Citizen A contributed $1,000 to your committee by check, you would list that, won't you? Yes, sir. By name and address? Uh, not in the pre-April 7th period, Senator, only uh, under the requirements of the new law. Well, we would if we had it, yes, sir. I mean, for internal purposes, we would attempt to have the addresses of all these individuals. That's correct. Did you list the cash contributions by name and address? Yes, sir. Not on this report we're talking about here, but all the cash contributors were merged into a composite list of contributors, and their addresses were listed on that report. In other words, there was a single record at the end of the April, pre-April 7th period that listed all con contributors to the campaign, including those who gave securities by check and by cash. It was a, a total record listing names and addresses of all our major contributors in that period. April 7th is an important date. Uh, I noticed from the GAO report that after that you had received uh, $50,000 from an anonymous source, which for some reason you preferred not to report as required by law. Can you tell us why? Uh, Senator, in the receipt of that money, I did not have the information on the basis to which I could make any report. At the time I left the committee, I had not made the effort to get that information. I, quite frankly, was too busy. It was one of the items, and there were four others, three others, that I pointed out to officials of the campaign at the time I left were items that needed to be resolved. They either had to be returned because the indications have been made that the donors wished to remain anonymous, and I did not know how to do that, or else we had to get the information, for instance, a $50,000 contribution to protect the individual on gift tax liability would have to be distributed among a number of committees. We did not know the wishes of the donor in that regard. I did not even know the name of the donor. I had no way to deal with that and essentially was holding it in escrow till I had that information. And what moved you to report this, or did you report this? Excuse me, you mean on a, uh, a final report or a report yes, to the... Yes, sir. Uh, Senator, at the time I left, this matter was unresolved. I made no report of it. Excuse me, Senator, I internally made reports of this to officials who I assumed were carrying on those responsibilities after my departure. When did you leave the committee? July 14, 1972. And after that, uh, were you employed? Not for a period of five months, Senator. And then where did you work? I worked for a period from January to March as a consultant at the Finance Committee to re-elect the President. And it is your testimony to this committee that during the period you served as treasurer of this committee to re-elect the president, and during which time you uh, 
were responsible for the cash disbursement of amounts uh, totaling about a million dollars. You did not at any time uh, have a twinge of suspicion as to the use of these funds? I think anybody has normal curiosity, Senator, but this had been, this procedures had been going on for nearly a period of a year and a half. Uh, in, in many cases, uh, it had been indicated uh, it just became an operating procedure. My, I was, quite frankly, too busy after a certain period of time to pursue curiosity. Uh, the, Did these people the, ever count to you as to whether the funds were used or not? No, sir, they did not. Because I think the Internal Revenue Service would like to know if the funds were spent. Otherwise, it would be income, would it not? I would imagine that's correct, Senator. I, I consider it from the, the, the committee standpoint that at the point it left my hands, I don't mean a single committee, but the funds of pre-April 7th committees, that that was, in fact, a final distribution from our standpoint as far as my responsibility to account for it. You indicated that you authorized and forwarded the sum of $350,000 in cash to Mr. Haldeman? I, I do not know where, whether he received it. Uh, my instructions on that uh, distribution uh, came through Mr. Comback. I understood from conversations with Mr. Comback that he had had a conversation with Mr. Bob Haldeman about this matter. Did Mr. Comback tell you how the funds were used? No, sir, he did not. Did you ever suspect that it might have gone into one's own pocket? No, sir. And as Treasurer, you were never curious as to how the funds were used? Uh, as I, I think I've indicated, Senator, uh, these were funds authorized by uh, higher authority, men who I've worked with for periods of five or six years. Uh, they're men I have uh, great trust in. I had no reason to be suspicious at that time of the motivations of any of these individuals. Now, as the events unfold, uh, how do you feel, sir? Quite frankly, Senator, uh, were you surprised? Yes, sir. My, every day I continue to be surprised. I thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Senator Weicker. Mr. Sloan, I'd like to, if we could, go back to your meeting with Mr. Haldeman in the White House in January of this year. Yes, sir. Now, first of all, uh, exactly when was the date of that meeting? Uh, Senator, I'm not sure of the precise date. My uh, best recollection from memory would be towards the end of January, perhaps uh, early February. And uh, am I correct in stating that you indicated the meeting lasted about 45 minutes? Yes, sir. Well, my first question would be uh, why? Why the meeting? Why did you request the meeting? Or did you request the meeting? Yes, sir, I did. Right. Uh, Senator, the, the reason I request the, requested the meeting, and I think uh, the period of time in question is important, uh, the criminal trial was over. Uh, I think some of the information on Mr. Segretti had come out. But generally, it was in a lull period where, in my judgment, uh, the decisions had been made. Uh, essentially, the matter had been gotten away with, that it stopped with the conviction of the seven men. I was at a point in time where I was actively seeking uh, private employment. Uh, Mr. Haldeman had essentially asked me to undertake this task. Uh, the continuing on of the political leadership in the campaign, uh, in opposition to the views I held, the fact that uh, presumably these same men were the source of any information that Mr. Haldeman had, I felt it was in, in my interest, particularly in terms of seeking private employment, to be sure that there was not an active effort on the part of the administration because of misinformation of the reasons I had done why I, what I had done, that there would be any active efforts to uh, make things difficult for me in terms of seeking private employment. 
Uh, as I say, I sought him out. Uh, I had a very cordial meeting with him, uh, spent about 45 minutes. Uh, I, I told him without naming names because I thought it was a dead issue, but I, I told him essentially that uh, I wanted to make very clear to him why I had done what I had done. And I said, I will also want you to know that I still feel total loyalty to the President of the United States. I worked for him over this period of time, and my wife has for a long period of time, because we believe in what he's doing. And I want you to know that I feel that I did not leave the team. As far as I'm concerned, the team left me. And I said, I cannot understand the continuing support of individuals who, in my judgment, it's pretty obvious, are involved in this situation. Uh, yeah, I think he interpreted part of the purpose of my meeting was essentially to feel out uh, the possibility of employment in the government. Uh, this was not my purpose. Uh, I had long ago made the decision that that is not what I wanted to do. However, it did produce the, the discussion on his part, a statement that the policy of the administration was that no individual who had become, quote, a Watergate figure or prominently mentioned in the newspapers would be placed in high government office until the issue was totally resolved. And I said, I totally understand that policy. I couldn't agree with you more. And he said, uh, I think in terms of your age and everything, this is, I agree with your decision. This is the right time to go out into the private sector if you want to make a career there. However, if at a later date when this matter is totally resolved, if you wish to be considered for a high position in government, uh, I will be glad to sponsor you. Uh, generally, I, I think this was the the tone and nature of, of this discussion. Now, uh, did that did that meeting have anything? Did that meeting have anything to do with your being rehired by the committee to reelect the president as a consultant? Uh, no, sir. I made that uh, decision. Uh, Prior to that, this would be probably about the midpoint during that consultancy. I went to the committee in, in early January, probably, I think, January 3rd. In other words, when you went to see Mr. Haldeman uh, in January, you already had been rehired. Yes, sir, that is correct. As a consultant to the committee to reelect the president. Finance committee. The political committee, as I understood it, uh, had essentially been dissolved, although that turned out not to be the case. Who rehired you as a consultant, or how did, how did the rehiring as a consultant to the Finance Committee come about? Uh, during the period after my resignation, uh, I would guess it is two occasions, uh, Secretary Stans had sought me out seeking my return to the campaign. Uh, and that was at what time? I'm not sure it would have been. Uh, I'm just not sure at some point during this five-month period following my resignation in July. Right. Uh, I in no way wish to consider this. Uh, I turned him down. After five months, with the election over, uh, he asked me again. He uh, Essentially, it was in the terms of, uh, you've taken a, essentially a, a bum rap on this thing, and uh, I know it's been difficult for you. You're five months without gainful employment. Uh, uh, I would like you to come back and help me wrap up the campaign. Uh, I consented because certain conditions which would have made it objectionable to me and why I would have refused such an offer uh, prior to that time were met. Uh, one, I did not feel if I had this kind of an opportunity at this particular point in time with no prejudice being attached to that association that I, in conscience, could go on and not provide for my family. Uh, the conditions that no longer existed, as far as I was concerned, was that the campaign was over. Uh, there was no liability or a spin-off effect on the president's chance for re-election by having someone who had been named as an, someone involved in this affair being associated with this campaign. The political leadership uh, who were essentially the people that I had had my argument with on the committee for the re-election of the president were no longer there. They had been essentially disbanded either by resignation, by uh, employment in the private sector, or had gone over to the inaugural committee. 
Uh, also, none of the assignments I would have, it was understood, would have anything to do uh, in, in the capacity of an official. It would be purely a personal working relationship with Maury Stans, uh, an assist to him in, in preparing to cope with some of the civil litigation uh, that would be forthcoming. So that your employment as a consultant was strictly as a result of Mr. Stans' request? Yes, sir, and my considered uh, judgment and, that... And your, and your judgment? At that time, uh, uh, I think it should be clear that I had already made my uh, testimony to the grand jury. Uh, although the criminal trial had not come up, one of the important considerations that I took into account in accepting such a position would be that there could be no possible misunderstanding in terms of having that having any effect on any subsequent testimony I would give. And no other individual was involved insofar as that rehiring was concerned. It was done by Mr. Stans, or were other persons consulted? It is possible that uh, Mr. Comback may have been involved in that decision. Why do you say that? Uh, Mr. Comback had uh, attempted to be helpful to me during this period in uh, seeking a private employment. Uh, he'd indicated on a number of occasions that he thought I'd made a mistake in resigning in the first place. He was. Uh, in frequent contact with Secretary Stans, I suspect uh, they had conversations to the effect of my personal situation as a result of, of what had happened. Additionally, Senator, I would say that part of the considered judgment to rejoin the Finance Committee is that I did not and do not believe that Secretary Stans in any way was involved in the original criminal activities. I thought he was left essentially holding the bag, and uh, I wanted to be helpful to him in that regard. Right. Uh, it is true, however, that during the, during the summer months and, and, and the fall months that, uh, that you did feel rather put upon, or maybe that's not the right word, maybe you have a better word for it, uh, insofar as uh, uh, those individuals that were in charge of the campaign. Did you, did you feel you were being treated uh, in, in a shabby fashion by them? Uh, I'd have to say, Senator, after I made my decision, with, uh, with the exception of a few of the phone calls we've referred to here, that uh, it was pretty much a, a hands-off situation. I just did not see any of the people. I mean, you, you, you were not one of uh, the, the favored uh, uh, at I all. I think that'd be fairly accurate, yes, sir. That's right. But what caused you to change your mind then and at the end of January, having been treated in that fashion, uh, Senator, go and uh, ask for an appointment with Mr. Haldeman? Uh, Senator, essentially, uh, one, I did not believe that the White House had any involvement uh, by the known facts at that point. I also did not believe that the Finance Committee had any involvement. Uh, I disagreed with Secretary Stans that we had some discussions early on after this affair along the lines that the Finance Committee, because of the very obvious potential for misunderstanding in terms of the financial transactions that presumably had uh, gone to these individuals, that the Finance Committee early on should have made a separate statement and attempted to separate itself away from the political committee in terms of its own conduct so that the financial transactions could be judged purely in terms of what they were. I had no knowledge that Secretary Stans knew what these funds were for. Uh, as far as I know, he accepted authorization of others as well. Uh, I just, these two areas, in my mind, were unconnected. I think there had been an error in judgment in not addressing the political problem and forcing a resolution there. Well, all right, I can understand that, but I just want to get back to the point that I'm trying to develop here is that at the time of your troubles, yes, sir. there were those that stood with you and those that stood apart from you. And there are quite a few in the middle. <laughs> and I think, right. I think, Senator, this may help answer your question that uh, it was very difficult in each and every individual case to determine where those individuals stood because people just weren't talking to each other about uh, the pertinent issues at this point. But you did know that you were one of the few people that were insisting upon telling the truth and you wouldn't deviate from that. Is that not correct? 
Yes, sir, but I, at that point in time, the, all the forums that were potentially on the horizon uh, for doing that uh, had disappeared. I had done what I thought was right. Uh, no resolution of the matter had been made on the basis of what I'd said, because basically I have very limited knowledge, only in the fact that from a factual basis, all that I could ever say is that I gave certain individuals certain money. And in the case of Mr. Magruder, it was a case of, yes, I knew I'd been approached to do that, but in terms of testimony where he gives a contrary testimony, uh, I can full well, certainly in that period of time, uh, fully understand the, the prosecutor's position, uh, unless they had additional information, which I have no way of knowing, where they could not proceed with that, where you have a simple situation of one man's word against another. I, I felt I'd done everything I could do. Nothing more was going to come out. It was all over. Uh, I'd essentially lost. Why did, you, why did you try to have lunch with Mr. Chapin? Is this the, you're not talking about the earlier meeting, you're talking about the, the lunch and what I called him when you had gone to United Airlines. Right. Well, I, th I think it essentially it's sort of the, the, the same kind of a, a situation as it was with Bob Haldeman. Here's a man I'd worked with for two and a half years. Uh, I had no, uh, uh, I had not seen anything of him since the one time I, I'd seen him in that whole period of time. Uh, I was about to leave town. He was about to leave town. Uh, I've seen a number of the people at the White House over this intervening period. I think that was purely social. Was there any concern in your mind that there were those in this picture who seemed to be ending up with uh, rather good jobs, both within and without government, while you seem to have been left standing by yourself? Well, I, and going back to the, the Haldeman meeting and his very definitive definition uh, to me of administration policy with regard to individuals who would not be appointed to positions in in government. Now, I do not know whether he meant positions that actually required presidential confirmation or Senate confirmation, excuse me. But uh, I think it was only a few days after that, after that meeting with Bob Haldeman, which uh, I felt very good about because he'd indicated to me there is, there is, you know, I realized some mistakes were made. There's nothing being held against you. Uh, good luck in the private sector type thing. But within, I, I think, a very short period of time after that, uh, Mr. Magruder's uh, appointment to the Commerce Department was announced, and uh, at that point I just threw up my hands. In answer to your question, uh, yes, sir, uh, it was obvious to me that not only did they not address the problem of the people, I think they had fairly strong indication were involved. Uh, I perhaps can understand the attempt to postpone it until after the political election, but there was certainly no attempt, even at that point, to take these people out of the picture. In other words, that possibly uh, integrity is a disability in this matter. The way uh, it's ultimately uh, believed going to be resolved, uh, I would not think uh, that it is a liability. I think it takes a long time. Well, let me get back, if I could, to the, to the meeting then with Mr. Haldeman. You indicated there was some talk about the, uh, the Segretti matter and that this would, uh, he explained that this would turn out all right. Yes, sir. He said when this received the full light of day that, uh, I, I'm not sure of his precise words, and I'm paraphrasing, that uh, it would be understandable to the American people. Now, what else was discussed? Forty-five minutes is a considerable period of time. Uh, the strawn payments, which uh, you had surmised, uh, uh, went to Mr. Haldeman. Uh, was this a matter of discussion during that, during that session? No, sir. No uh, uh, subject matter with regard to the finance campaign activities came up at all. I was, it was not my purpose to be there to discuss any of those matters. In other words, neither the payments to Liddy nor uh, to Strawn, none of, none of these matters were discussed at all during that 45-minute session. No, sir. Only uh, uh, that discussion was really at my initiative, uh, not on those matters, but in a very broad sense, uh, as I referred to a, a minute ago, in explaining that I, you know, that the team had left me uh, at that kind of a context. I mentioned 
I'd been approached to perjure myself to take the Fifth Amendment, but I did not feel that it was appropriate to make specific allegations as to individuals. I figured that had already been addressed in the judicial process, and uh, the point was moot. Did you feel that the basic purpose of the meeting then was that, that you would need the support uh, of the administration in finding employment in the future? Uh, no, sir. I think I was looking at it more from the other side of the coin, and I wanted to be sure there would not be active efforts to inhibit my own efforts. The fear of, of retribution. Of retribution. Yes, sir. Now, one last question, uh, Mr. Sloan. You've been very patient and, and uh, very responsive, also. Uh, how are the uh, how are the payments to uh, Mr. Liddy made? In what form? You've indicated, for example, that in Mr. Strawn's case, it was put in a suitcase. Uh, what was the nature of payment? Uh, was the form of payment to uh, Mr. Liddy? Uh, in view of the fact he was physically located in the uh, same uh, suite of offices I was, he would generally just tell me he needed X number of dollars, and uh, generally I would go get it and just put it in a manila envelope or something of this sort. I think on one occasion uh, uh, I was going to be out of town. Uh, at a time he needed to to pick up certain funds. I think on that occasion he had his secretary, Sally Harmony, come in with an envelope. You say that uh, Sally Harmony uh, picked up the money from you? Uh, yes, sir. On one occasion, I believe that's correct. On one occasion? In an envelope. In other words, she, she uh, uh, and I had forgotten this, but other testimony has brought it to mind. Uh, the. That, I think the circumstances were that he must, he must have been out of town and called me and said, uh, I need uh, whatever the, the amount was. Uh, the only time I could pick it up is I'm coming in on Sunday or something. He said, uh, what I'll, I'll do is I'll, I'll tell Sally to come into your office with an envelope and uh, you take care of the matter and I don't want her to know what it is and she'll put it in my, he had a locked file drawer cabinet in his office and she knows the combination will put it in there. So you turned the money over in an envelope to her? Yes, sir. She did not see it. She did not see the money no, that, that she was given the envelope. Correct, she understood that this was money in the envelope. No, not to my knowledge. She uh, did not. Uh, as I recall it, uh, uh, and I'm not positive my recollection is correct, I think Mr. Liddy stressed the fact that he did not want her to know that this was money. Fine. And one last question uh, 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 in relation to, again, to the Haldeman meeting. Was there any discussion at all at that meeting of... Uh, 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 Mr. Magruder's perjury suggestion? Uh, I did not mention it by name, but I, I, in relating to him why I was, uh, why I had left, I was trying to give him an accounting of why I'd made the personal decisions I had. I said I had been asked to perjure myself on numerous occasions. And uh, in my judgment, had uh, there was pressure to take the Fifth Amendment, and I said, I'm just, Bob, I was just not prepared to do that kind of a thing. And what was his response? Uh, I. I'm not positive. I think I'd be putting words in his mouth, but I, I think it was to the effect that, uh, well, I realized there were some mistakes made in the early period. I have no further questions, Mr. Chairman. And so Hugh Sloan has told the committee that despite his concerns about a cover-up, he did not believe the White House was involved. Sloan's version of events places Jeb Magruder at the center of efforts to maintain silence about the money that went to G. Gordon Liddy. In a moment, Sloan will go through a final round of questioning. At this point, we'd like to thank you again for your response to these broadcasts. We consider it overwhelming. More than 70,000 letters, 99% of them approving this kind of gavel-to-gavel -gavel coverage. Most of the comments indicate that people appreciate the opportunity to see the hearings in full and after normal working hours. We've heard from a cross-section of viewers including an Air Force sergeant in Maine, a student in Puerto Rico, and an advertising executive in Chicago. Here are some of the opinions we've sampled. From Norman Wilson in Dallas, Oregon, your presentation of the hearings will do more to generate public participation in the political process than anything else. The question, what price apathy, is clearly being answered. From C.F. Crosby in Seminole, Florida, coverage of the Facts of Life, Senate hearings, is finally making my TV worth owning. And from Dallas, Texas, Mr. and Mrs. R. H. Leeper, a suggestion. How about expanding this sort of thing to a different committee every week or two? 
so we can help further our understanding of the workings of government that might even shape up some of our legislators. Of course, some of our letters have been critical of this type of coverage. For example, Mrs. Earl Stanley of Parkersburg, West Virginia, thinks it's ridiculous, adding, What country besides America would want to publicize a scandal in the government? Why all this frantic effort of the news media just to inform the people about these men who fell flat on their faces? Or is it for other reasons? Well, we're grateful to everyone who's written. And if you would still like to express an opinion, we encourage you to do it to your local public television station. Each station decides for itself in our system whether to carry this kind of programming, and they'd welcome your cards and letters. Remember, they also depend on your financial support to stay on the air. Public television's coverage of the Senate hearings will continue after this pause for station identification. Unabridged coverage of these hearings is provided as a public service by the member stations of PBS, the Public Broadcasting Service. From Washington, NPACT continues its coverage of hearings by the Senate Select Committee on Presidential Campaign Activities. Here again, correspondent Robert McNeil. As we return to the hearings, former campaign treasurer Hugh Sloan is about to be questioned by Senator Joseph Montoya. Senator Montoya. <clears throat> Mr. Sloan, <clears throat> I believe you testified yesterday that in arriving at the figures represented by this chart with respect to reimbursement to different individuals, that uh, you had gone to these individuals personally and uh, reconciled uh, the memories, both you and the individuals, and arrived at this figure as a reconciliation. Is that correct? Uh, yes, sir. Probably not in every individual case. For instance, like Mr. Nossinger, uh where there was almost a single or just a, a, a double distribution uh, and the person was not available. This would generally uh, relate to, for instance, the Porter, Liddy, Mabuder, Comback uh, situations where there were multiple distributions where over a period of time uh, some discrepancy could grow up. Now I ask you, <clears throat> was the figure of $250,000 to Mr. Comback reconciled with him? Uh, Senator, these, these figures here are... To the best of my recollection, I realize they are not precise. Uh, they could be dollars and cents off. Uh, could there be any material deviation or, di or, or variation? Oh, no, sir. Uh, in terms of what the precise figure was, we did agree in every case. There was no discrepancy with any individual I talked to. Could uh, your figures with Mr. Porter uh, differ in an amount close to $50,000? $50, would that be possible? 
Senator, I, again, after a year, it is possible. This is my best recollection of what the figure was. Uh, the Liddy matter, I think I'm, uh, for instance, I'm, I'm far sure of that figure than Mr. Porter's because uh, Mr. Liddy was the issue at the time. But to the best of your recollection, and after reconciliation with Mr. Porter, you still state that uh, you dispersed to him the sum of $100,000. Uh, sir, that is my best recollection. If he has a different recollection, I would not, uh, you know, I would not stand on a hard figure of 100000 That's my best approximation of what I recall I gave him. Were you familiar with the activities of Mr. Porter? In terms of what he did with his money? Yes. Or? No, sir. Are you now? Uh, I have heard, read some stories in the press. Yes, sir. Uh, what information can you give this committee from those reports and what, from what you have gathered since you left the committee? Uh, I, I believe it came out at the criminal trial that of the funds that I had given to Mr. Porter, he evidently in turn had uh, turned over $35,000 of those funds uh, to Mr. Liddy, which produced the, the aggregate figure that was used in the trial of the funds that were made available to Mr. Liddy. Did you, did you also ascertain that uh, some of this money was used for the dirty tricks part of the campaign? Uh, there was a story about a student named uh, Mr. Brill. Uh, and there's a convoluted uh, chain of custody here, of, uh, I believe, from Mr. Porter to Mr. Reitz to uh, Mr. Gorton to Mr. Brill for, uh, for uh, I, I'm not sure spying is the right word, but whatever those activities were. Are you aware of any other extended activities besides those two instances in this particular category? I think those are the only two that I'm aware of, Senator. Uh, you stated that a report on the finances was given to Mr. Stance on one or two occasions, did you not? Uh, yes, in terms of these cash funds, yes, sir, there were two or three reports in that period from uh, February 15th when he came on board until the final report, which I gave him on June 23rd. And you did not state the purpose of those disbursements? as uh, told to you by individuals, if they told you? Uh, I have never been told uh, directly by any of these individuals, sir. Uh, I believe you questioned some of the disbursements to Mr. Porter and to Mr. Liddy at one time and uh, took this matter up with Mr. Stans, did you not? Yes, sir, I did. And uh, you also took this matter up with Mr. Magruder, is that correct? Yes, sir. And. Uh, Mr. Magruder told you, in turn, that uh, you were not to uh, question the requests uh, at all, but uh, to make the disbursements as they were requested of you. Is that correct? Yes, sir. And uh, did you file or prepare any reports as to what you were doing with this money? Uh, not internally. With... Internally. Just these reports I gave to Secretary Stans. They were the only reports, and he was the only recipient of those reports. Did you provide any copies of any reports to the White House? No, sir. Uh, wasn't oh, excuse it... me, not of these cash funds, no, sir, not to my knowledge. Well, uh, any other reports? Uh, as I understand it, and I think this happened after I left, in terms of the, the aggregate report of all contributors uh, that we put together uh, as a reconciliation of the pre-April 7th period by category. For instance, uh, all the contributors who gave uh, above $250,000 might be category one, above 100,000, Category 2, and so forth. Well, will you uh, further categorize the Category 1, Category 2? What uh, particular information did you uh, really uh, specify by way of more definition? Well, these, these reports would merely list the name of the person, the address, and the total amount. In other words, it would be an aggregate figure of what they'd given to multiple committees. Uh, it would include all cash, currency, and securities. All right, then do I understand you to say that these reports then reflected the disbursements prior to uh, April the 7th to Mr. Liddy, to Mr. Porter, and to the others? Oh, no, excuse me, sir. I'm sorry. These are contributor reports, not disbursement reports. Uh, I, I, I misunderstood you. I apologize. The, the report I'm referring to is a, a listing of all contributors, which without the dollar amount by category, I believe, was made available to the White House. Disbursements, I do not believe, were uh, any reports were ever given to the White House that way. All right. Well, who received a report uh, on the disbursements besides Mr. Stans? Uh, as far as I know, in terms of these cash...
Uh, your figures with Mr. Porter uh, differ to, in an amount close to $50,000. $50, Would that be possible? Senator, I, again, after a year, it is possible. This is my best recollection what the figure was. Uh, the Liddy matter, I think I'm, uh, for instance, I'm, I'm far sure of that figure than Mr. Porter's because uh, Mr. Liddy was the issue at the time. But to the best of your recollection, and after reconciliation with Mr. Porter, you still state that uh, you dispersed to him the sum of $100,000. Uh, sir, that is my best recollection. If he has a different recollection, I would not, uh, you know, I would not stand on a hard figure of 100000 That's my best approximation of what I recall I gave him. Were you familiar with the activities of Mr. Porter? In terms of what he did with his money? Yes. Or? No, sir. Are you now? Uh, I have heard, read some stories in the press. Yes, sir. Uh, what information can you give this committee from those reports and what, from what you have gathered since you left the committee? Uh, I, I believe it came out at the criminal trial that of the funds that I had given to Mr. Porter, he evidently in turn had uh, turned over $35,000 of those funds uh, to Mr. Liddy, which produced the, the aggregate figure that was used in the trial of the funds that were made available to Mr. Liddy. Did you, did you also ascertain that uh, some of this money was used for the dirty tricks part of the campaign? Uh, there was a story about a student named uh, Mr. Brill. Uh, and there's a convoluted uh, chain of custody here, of, uh, I believe, from Mr. Porter to Mr. Reitz to uh, Mr. Gorton to Mr. Brill for, uh, for uh, I, I'm not sure spying is the right word, but whatever those activities were. Are you aware of any other extended activities besides those two instances in this particular category? I think those are the only two that I'm aware of, Senator. Uh, you stated that a report on the finances was given to Mr. Stance on one or two occasions, did you not? Uh, yes, in terms of these cash funds, yes, sir, there were two or three reports in that period from uh, February 15th when he came on board until the final report, which I gave him on June 23rd. And you did not state the purpose of those disbursements? as uh, told to you by individuals, if they told you? Uh, I have never been told uh, directly by any of these individuals, sir. Uh, I believe you questioned some of the disbursements to Mr. Porter and to Mr. Liddy at one time and uh, took this matter up with Mr. Stance, did you not? Yes, sir, I did. And uh, you also took this matter up with Mr. Magruder, is that correct? Yes, sir. And. Uh, Mr. Magruder told you, in turn, that uh, you were not to uh, question the requests uh, at all, but uh, to make the disbursements as they were requested of you. Is that correct? Yes, sir. And uh, did you file or prepare any reports as to what you were doing with this money? Uh, not Internally. With... Internally. Just these reports I gave to Secretary Stans. They were the only reports, and he was the only recipient of those reports. Did you provide any copies of any reports to the White House? No, sir. Uh, wasn't oh, excuse it... me, not of uh, these cash funds, no, sir, not to my knowledge. Well, uh, any other reports? Uh, as I understand it, and I think this happened after I left in terms of the, the aggregate report of all contributors uh, that we put together uh, as a reconciliation of the pre-April 7th period by category. For instance, uh, all the contributors who gave uh, above $250,000 might be category one, above 100,000, Category 2, and so forth. Well, will you uh, further categorize the Category 1, Category 2? What uh, particular information did you uh, really uh, specify by way of more definition? Well, these, these reports would merely list the name of the person, the address, and the total amount. In other words, it would be an aggregate figure of what they'd given to multiple committees. Uh, it would include all cash, currency, and securities. All right, then do I understand you to say that these reports then reflected the disbursements prior to uh, April the 7th to Mr. Liddy, to Mr. Porter, and to the others? Oh, no, excuse me, sir. I'm sorry. These are contributor reports, not disbursement reports. Uh, I, I'm, I misunderstood you. I apologize. The, the report I'm referring to is a, a listing of all contributors, which without the dollar amount by category, I believe, was made available to the White House. Disbursements, I do not believe, were uh, any reports were ever given to the White House that way. All right. Well, who received a report uh, on the disbursements besides Mr. Stans? Uh, as far as I know, in terms of these cash funds, he is the only individual I ever gave that report to. You never gave any of these reports to Mr. Mitchell or to Mr. Magruder? No, sir. 
Do you know whether or not Mr. Stance did? I do not from personal knowledge, no, sir. Uh, did you ever uh, uh, talk to Mr. Magruder, to Mr. Mitchell, or to anyone else other than Mr. Stance and uh, verbally tell them how you were dispersing this cash? Well, there were, there were, as the authority for this distribution of funds evolved, there were obviously conversations with these individuals. They were, certainly Mr. Magruder uh, had a working knowledge of who was receiving a number of these uh, distributions. For instance, uh, he was responsible for the one he received, uh, the Liddy ones, the Porter ones. Probably did not know about the one to Mr. Strawn. Uh, Mr. Comback was separate. Uh, I would say those are the ones he was familiar with. Well, in view of your... Uh, later understanding and instruction, uh, doesn't it stand to reason that uh, Mr. Mitchell, who was consulted on these expenditures by Mr. Magruder, doesn't it stand to reason that he knew of the disbursements to Mr. Liddy and to Mr. Porter? Uh, Senator, you know, I would be making an assumption, obviously, but I think in an organizational sense, it is inconceivable to me that he would not be, in a general sense, if his aides were doing their proper job aware of this kind of situation. Certainly Mr. Stans indicated to me on two occasions that that was the source of his confirmation that I should continue on making distributions so that certainly Mr. Mitchell had some knowledge, yes, sir. So as far as you knew, Mr. Mitchell was aware of these disbursements? I... I From that uh, indication? Yeah, I, he's aware of, I was aware of some of them, whether he had any knowledge of total figures, whether the secretary gave him a rundown at any particular time, I do not know from personal knowledge. Uh, did you uh, know at the time for what uh, purposes Mr. Liddy was going to use this money? No, sir, I did not. Have you since then ascertained for what purpose he did use this money? Uh, I understand from the conviction in the Watergate trial that certainly a certain element of this money was used uh, in support of, of that particular operation. In support of clandestine activities? Yes, sir. And uh, you stated... And uh, the chart reflects that uh, you dispersed $199,000 to Mr. Liddy, and that later he received the checks which came in from Mexico, and uh, that they were taken to Miami, and that this totaled 114000 Is that correct? Yes, sir, but I did receive that money back. How much of it did you receive back? Uh, approximately 112000 There was a discrepancy of about $2,500. Now, uh, was it your understanding that uh, Mr. Mitchell and Mr. Magruder approved all of the reimbursements before and after April the 7th? Uh, reimbursements, sir? Or disbursements, rather. Uh, was it your understanding that Mr. Mitchell and Mr. Magruder approved of all disbursements made by you before and April the 7th? Yes, sir. What was the carryover amount from the 1968 campaign? I'm not sure of the figures here, Senator. I, I may be carrying one in another, uh, but I can give you the dimensions of it. I, I think the total amount of 1968 funds that were turned over to me uh, in the pre-April 7th period probably amounted to about $580,000. Uh, most of this was out of a bank account from which checks were written directly into existing committees. The I think there was approximately $230,000 in cash. Now, whether that is part of the 580 or whether it's separate from that, I am not sure from my own memory. But this is the money that Mr. Francis Rain uh, brought on behalf of Mr. Comback from California, and that money would be a part of the total receipts in the, the cash area as listed here. But uh, to the best of your recollection, as you've stated before, prior to April the 7th, 1973, uh, you had uh, received approximately $20 million. Is that correct? Uh, for April 7th, 1972, yes, sir. Mm -hmm. And uh, I believe you stated uh, that those were hectic days prior to April the 7th. Yes, sir. They certainly and, uh, were. And that you were in constant turmoil trying to meet the deadline and to get all the cash in. Yes, sir. And uh, uh, what was your policy with respect to contributions uh, about which people called and asked you to pick them up? 
I'm not sure I received the calls directly, but what was being done at the committee, uh, we were using essentially any available people we had who could travel for us at that time. Uh, for instance, uh, Ken Talmadge, who was an administrative uh, assistant to uh, Secretary Stans, made a number of trips during this period to New York, for instance, to visit uh, contributors to pick up their contributions and so forth. Was there any ceiling on the pickup during those last days? Uh, I would say I'm not sure there's a dollar amount and I may have been misunderstood in a previous deposition on this. Uh, there was one case where we could not, we did not think it worth our while to pick up a $100,000 contribution, which happened to be the money in Mexico, which showed up anyway. But generally, there were certain sums that the man just could not get around all the places, and he did it by priorities. He took the largest sums first. So there were situations where we couldn't pick up a $50,000 contribution, for instance. Well, didn't you indicate to the commission, uh, to the committee in your deposition or interview that uh, in those last hectic days that uh, your, your limitation of pickup was $100,000 or over? I, that may have been overstated, Senator. There was no set amount. I think that came out of a citing an example, the fact that uh, in one case we made that decision with regard to a $100,000 contribution. I, I know of no policy that stipulated, uh, you know, below a certain level. Well, you weren't picking up any $5,000 contributions during those hectic days, were you? Uh, no, sir. They'd have to come in by mail. We do not have the uh, manpower. You, you weren't picking up any $10,000 contributions during those hectic days when all your manpower was being used internally and to collect the big amounts, were you? Uh, it would depend on sort of the area. For instance, if a man went to New York and uh, there are two men working in the same business office and one of them had 10000 uh, it would be easy to pick up. But I would say if there was a question of choice or priority or a disproportionate amount of time and going up to pick up, up a lesser amount, he would not do that. How many men would you say you had uh, during those last few days on pickup missions? John, I'm just not sure, Senator. Probably two or three people were... Uh, Maybe more than that, maybe as many as uh, seven or eight were moving around. Mm -hmm. Did you have any pickup men in California? Uh, I'm just not sure. Mr. Kombach, of course, was out there. He was very active. Well, he was in our headquarters that period of time. He would go back on weekends. Uh, he may very well have brought money back. Uh, in that general period of the last month, whether uh, there was a pickup uh, the last day or two, I'm not sure. Did you have a pickup division within the Finance Committee? Uh, no, sir. There was, this was not a structured thing. It was a matter of uh, necessity uh, and using whoever was available. Mm -hmm. Now, when you went to Mr. Mitchell's office to explain the situation and to tell him that the FBI were downstairs waiting, would you please be a little more specific as to who accompanied you there and what conversation took place while you were in there, who opened up the conversation, and what transpired? Uh, Senator, my, my best recollection was that when I had the call that two agents from the Federal Bureau were in my office, I was in a meeting with Fred LaRue at that point in his office. He indicated to me, I think you ought to see John Mitchell before you go down. He, at that point, left me and went down the hall to John Mitchell's office, uh, came back in a minute or two, and asked me to accompany him back into the room. Uh, present, to the best of my knowledge, then, would have been Mr. LaRue, myself, Mr. Mitchell. I know Mr. Mardian was there, and possibly Mr. Magruder. Uh, I do not have a good sense of uh, how I expressed my concern or anything. I think it was a, there was a obvious time pressure here. The men were sitting there. It was a, a look for a, some quick guidance. Uh, I indicated, what he, essentially, what do you want me to say? Uh, these men are here. And I was concerned at that point. I could not believe that they were not there to talk to me about finances and Mr. Liddy and the, and the Watergate and everything else. Well, so, so this I, is, I fully appreciate, Mr. Sloan, that you were very concerned because the FBI were downstairs. And uh, you may not remember, I can appreciate your concern when you walked into Mr. Mitchell's office. But now, you must have said something to Mr. Mitchell. Oh, yes, sir. I'm sure I did. What did you say? I have no uh, direct recollection of what I said other than it, the purpose of my being there, so that whatever I said had to be in that context. Uh, I, need some, I need some guidance. What do you want me to do? As I'm sure the kind of uh, way it was presented, uh, Bob Marty, and uh, I recall uh, the first person, he put his hand on my knee, and he said, well, the first thing you've got to do is calm down. 
And then at that point, Mr. Mitchell made his comment, and uh, that's the last strong recollection I have of that meeting. Uh, did Mr. Mardian suggest uh, to you anything that you might say to the FBI? No, sir. When I left that meeting, I had absolutely no guidance except to go down and see him. Did you to... have any guidance before you went in to see Mr. Mitchell from either Mr. Mardian, Mr. Magruder, or uh, Mr. LaRue? No, sir. I had no guidance at all. At that uh, did you engage in any discussions with them as to what you might say to the FBI? Uh, no, sir. When the, when the matter came up, it happened. It developed so fast that I, I assumed that Mr. LaRue, by suggesting I see John Mitchell, the purpose of that was to give me some guidance. Uh, none was forthcoming. Mm -hmm. Now, let us go into the California trip. I believe you were gone with Mr. Stans for uh, approximately five or six days. Yes, sir. Now, um, did you stay in the same hotels with him? Uh, yes, sir, I did after I joined him. I went out on uh, uh, the morning of the 7th, which I believe is a Friday morning, and I did not join him till the evening of uh, the 9th, which would be the Sunday night. From that point on, uh, for the balance of the week, I traveled with him, yes, sir. And uh, did you share the same room or adjoining rooms? Uh, no, sir. They might be neighboring rooms, but uh, they were not adjoining or uh, the same suite. Uh, what duties did you perform while you were with him on this trip? Uh, I was, I think, merely a good listener at the fundraising meetings he had and uh, met some of our people who were operating on our behalf in the field. I had uh, no specific duties as such. What conversations did you have with Mr. Stance with respect to uh, the Watergate affair and the cash disbursements that took place? Uh, during uh, this sordid affair? Uh, the Watergate, obviously, I, I think the, the point in time, the, the, the principal emphasis uh, in terms of what was going on in the newspapers and what the level of concern was, was re with regard to the Mexican checks and the Dahlberg matters. As a matter of fact, Mr. Dahlberg joined us, I believe, in Des Moines and spent quite a bit of time with Secretary Stance. Uh, yes. Now, what, uh, what did Mr. Dahlberg discuss in Des Moines during that trip I with did not, Mr. Stans? I do not know. I was not present at that meeting, sir. How did Mr. Dahlberg uh, uh, meet with Mr. Stans in Des Moines? I believe it was in uh, his hotel room. Isn't Mr. Dahlberg the individual who transported the Mexican money uh, from Dallas, Texas to Washington? Yes, sir. That's my understanding. Mm -hmm. How long did they meet? Uh, I really don't know. Is in, in terms of a conversation that Mr. Dahlberg uh, mentioned to me that he had met the previous evening or whatever it was with Mr. Stans. Mm -hmm. Was, uh, <clears throat> were you ever aware of any meetings between the President and Mr. Stans with respect to campaign financing? Uh, I know he met uh, with the President uh, that I'm aware of maybe once after he joined the committee and once uh, probably after the election. I do not know what the subject matter was or whether it was even on the subject of finance. Did you, in your reports to the White House or to Mr. Stance, reflect uh, uh, balances periodically of what was in the campaign fund? Oh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. And how were these uh, reports transmitted to the White House? Um, oh, uh, excuse me. I, I've never made such a report to the White House, uh, Senator. Uh, did anyone from the White House pick up any of these reports, either from you or Mr. Stance? Uh, not that I'm aware of. Now, you stated that you were aware that Mr. Liddy was spending approximately 90 percent of his time on uh, Finance Committee matters as counsel. Yes, sir. Were you aware of how he was spending the other 10 percent of his time? Uh, no, sir. When he, when he joined the Finance Committee, he uh, indicated to me that he would have continuing projects for the political side of the campaign. Mr. Magruder confirmed that fact to me. Uh, no discussion uh, took place as to the nature of those duties. Did it ever arouse your curiosity that uh, Mr. Liddy might be performing other tasks? Uh, I was fully aware that he was, you know, spending some time on other affairs. I just did not know what they were. Mm -hmm. Now, what led you to believe, as you stated, that the disbursement of $10,000 to a Mr. Lynn Nausiger was to recruit a team of American Nazis 
to disrupt the Wallace candidacy in California? Uh, Senator, uh, I have no knowledge of that. Uh, I believe my statement yesterday with regard to that $10,000, there was a as we went through this list, it was a question, a query as to, did you know what any of these expenditures were for? And in the case of Mr. Nossinger in, in California, I had said subsequent to that disbursement, uh, I had heard by rumor, and I cannot even tell you who from, that it had something to do with the Wallace campaign in California, but that is the extent of my knowledge in that matter. Now, in your meeting with Mr. Ehrlichman, I believe it was on uh, July the – or June the 23rd, I believe, at the White House. Yes, sir. Uh, you started discussing with uh, Mr. Ehrlichman uh, the problem of how you were going to face up to the reporting of the cash disbursement. Is that correct? Uh, no, sir. I have really have – uh, no precise recollection of how and to what depth or dimension I expressed my concern to him. I, I think it was in the nature, and uh, it was a by by way of just indicating to him that I think there's a problem. I did not get to the point of uh, I am sure of mentioning names or uh, leveling allegations at anybody. I well, was. Well, in in what context did you? Uh uh, place that observation to him that sh that there was a problem. Well, Senator, this there must have been some context. Oh, yes, sir. The 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 party on the boat on the Potomac the night before, uh, I think probably that day or in that period of time, it had become known that these gentlemen who were were caught or in their room at the Watergate had fifty three hundred dollars in uh, fifty three hundred dollars hundred dollar bills. Uh, I'd obviously had an initial concern with regard to Mr. Liddy's first remark. When the money issue came up, it obviously indicated to me there might be a direct connection that that money may in fact have been money that uh, I had given Mr. Liddy or to somebody in the campaign. I think what I was expressing is we have a situation here where there is no accountability of these funds as far as I know. At least there's been none to me and as far as I know Secretary Stans doesn't know. In light of this, uh, there's a suspicion, a possibility that there is a connection, and uh, what I was trying to convey, whether uh, I do not know how uh, hard I pressed the point, uh, what I was trying to convey to Mr. Ehrlichman and Mr. Chapin was that uh, I thought it was a more serious problem than any individual I'd seen either in the White House or in the campaign appeared to be taking it at that point. So in your observations to Mr. Ehrlichman on June 23rd, you tried to connect the existence of cash on the person of the burglars with the distributions that you had made to Mr. Liddy? Uh, sir, I, I just, in fairness, I, I just do not have that good a recollection of how well, I presented this concern. I just well, do not was know. it in that area? Uh, that was my concern. Whether I expressed it in those terms to him, I do not know. Whether but you did have conversations with Mr. Ehrlichman relating to this, whether it was specific as I've stated it or not, you did have such a conversation. Oh, yes, sir, and it was certainly in the context of uh, the event of the Watergate. And then, uh, and it was then that Mr. Ehrlichman told you uh, that if you had any personal problems that uh, he could help you with, uh, that he would be willing to do anything to help you with his personal problems with your personal problems? Yes, sir. And he also said that he would take these problems up with the President, and he was certain that this would be covered by executive privilege. Uh, no, sir. That's an incorrect statement. Well, what uh, did you say? Uh, he, and what did he say? He uh, indicated to me, uh, after he recognized my concern in a personal sense, uh, and had indicated to me that I had a special relationship with the White House since I'd worked there and since they'd asked me to get into the campaign. He'd be very glad to be helpful if it was a question of getting a, pri a lawyer. Uh, I, I said, well, that may be a problem, but that's not really why I'm here. I, sa I said, I'd like to get into some depth on this. And he said, no, don't give me the details. He said, my position personally would have to be that I would take executive privilege until after the election. Now, I thought the remark somewhat strange, but at the time and the context, I interpreted that as a statement on his part that 
he was involved in running the government and did not want to be in a position of having knowledge that he could get it dragged into all these court cases. A civil suit had been filed at that time. I, th I interpret it as a statement that uh, my job is to work here with the president, uh, to run the domestic council, and that if it's a campaign problem, they've got to work it out. Well, did he mention that uh, the president would help you out with your personal problems? Uh, no, sir. The, the president's name uh, never came up as far as I know. All right. Now, let us get, uh, get on with a boat ride on the Potomac. Now, who invited you to go on that boat ride? Uh, it was a farewell party for the Army aide to the President of the United States, Vernon Coffey, who is a close personal friend of ours, and in addition to the White House personnel invited, both my wife and I had worked with him at the White House, and we were included on that guest list. When were you invited? Uh, on the same day? Oh, no, I think it would have been uh, probably a week's lead time or something of the sort. I'm not sure. And uh, who was there at the party? Oh, it was a very large party, probably uh, 150 uh, people or more. Well, was uh, Mr. Chapin there? Yes, sir, he was. Mr. Colson? Uh, I'm not sure whether Mr. Mr. Colson. Mr. Dean? I do not recall seeing Mr. Dean. Well, who of the individuals who have been mentioned here were there that night? Uh, Mr. Cole, uh, Mr. Chapin, uh, Mr. Pat Buchanan. Those are the three individuals I recall talking to. Uh, Did you go into a corner to talk to them about this matter? Uh, there, there really weren't too many corners, uh, Senator, on this. <laughs> but, but we attempted to get a certain measure of privacy, yes, sir. And uh, who solicited who for these conversations? Uh, Senator, in, in terms of my best recollection of the events that had happened, I, I think quite possibly the first Magruder suggestion had been made to me at that point. Uh, my wife reminds me that when uh, I was picked up at the office that day by her to go to this party, that I was extremely angry and upset. And uh, I'm, I'm sure under those circumstances that uh, the concerns were very heightened in my mind, and I sought these individuals out. You sought these people yes, out? Yes, sir, I did. And uh, you did discuss this affair? Uh, yes, sir. To what depth? I, I just cannot recall as to precisely what knowledge was available at that point in time. Well, was it as a result of your conversations with Mr. Chapin that he invited you to meet with him at the White House at 12 o'clock the next day? Yes, sir. That's my best recollection. And you did meet with him uh, for lunch, would you say, or, or just for conversation? I'm, di I'm just, uh, I did not meet with him for lunch, uh, and I'm not quite sure of the precise timing. I'm sure I talked to both those individuals on the same day. And was it as a result of your conversation at 12 o'clock noon with Mr. Chapin that you then, at 2 o'clock on the same day, saw Mr. Ehrlichman? Uh, no, sir. They were, they were originated independently. The Ehrlichman appointment resulted from a conversation I'd had with his deputy, Ken Cole, the night before. I think what I was expressing to both Mr. Cole and Mr. Chapin, who were principal assistants, uh, in, uh, Mr. Ehrlichman and Mr. Haldeman, was that I felt that either John or Bob ought to have this information. Uh, in the case of Mr. Chapin, I assumed that in talking to him, that at least my concern would be relayed. Uh, I do not know whether I request a specific appointment with Bob Haldeman. In the case of Ken Cole, he called me or his office called me the next day and said, John Ehrlichman would like to to see you, and I believe it was 2 o'clock, which indicated to me he'd expressed, uh, and he'd indicated to me the night before he would relay my concerns to Mr. Ehrlichman. And who was present at this con uh, conference with Mr. Ehrlichman? Um, no one as far as I know, sir. No, I mean, I know no one was there, excuse me, except myself. Mm -hmm. Now, you have uh, indicated in your testimony before this committee that uh, Mr. Magruder tried to get you to do certain things and that you, in turn, uh, indicated that uh, if Mr. Magruder would be up for an appointment, that you would personally come and testify against any confirmation. Now, uh, why did you single out Mr. Magruder and not any of the others who had been working on you to perjure yourself? Uh, Senator, he was the... Uh, uh the only individual that I could clearly identify in my mind without any doubt whatsoever. I mean, there was just no question in my mind. The case of Mr. LaRue in asking if you agreed to a figure, he could very well have had misrepresentations from Mr. Magruder and perhaps legitimately think that there was a discrepancy and it was merely a question of resolving the, the figure. So that he is the only individual who specifically requested of me that I consider an illegal act as far as I know. 
Now, you also mentioned that uh, on your return from California that you uh, had a drink with Mr. Magruder and that he, in turn, suggested to you that uh, both of you visit Mr. Titus at the U.S. Attorney's Office. Yes, sir. And why was Excuse he... Excuse me, that was return from Bermuda. Uh, oh, Bermuda. Yes, sir. Bermuda. Why was he the moving force here when there was nothing pending and no request had been made of you to testify or to present yourself at the U.S. Attorney's Office? Why was he so anxious to take you there? Uh, Senator, I, I believe the grand jury had been uh, convened at that point in time. Well, was he running uh, liaison between the grand jury and the Watergate people? Uh, or the people associated with the finance committee? Uh, I was quite amazed at the fact he would call me in light of my conversation with Bob Marty in, in response to the first suggestion he'd made, where I'd indicated if this is the way, you know, you guys are going, I just don't want to deal with this man again. I mean, I'm certainly prepared at that point in time and the way it was suggested to, to overlook his initial remark, but by the, the second time, uh, there was no question in my mind. Well, did you ask him why he wanted you to go to the U.S. Attorney's Office? Uh, uh, without invitation from the U.S. District Attorney? I believe, Senator, that the, the climate at that point in time was that uh, very rapidly uh, uh, the grand jury essentially was moving up through the echelons of the campaign, starting uh, with secretaries and people who worked for people. And it was only a matter of days before, uh, if you will, principals who had knowledge, uh, at least as far as this money, would come up. And I think my guess would be that it would be an attempt to head off, you know, have an organized disclosure as opposed to individuals going in separately with differing stories. Well, did Mr. Magruder indicate to you that if you went to see Mr. Titus, that uh, Mr. Titus would aid in staving off any further inquiry? Oh, no, sir. There was no such indication. What was the specific purpose for which he wanted to go, or you to go? Uh, I I'm really not sure, Senator. I, I, again, it's very hard to reconstruct exactly what was known at that point in time, but the, the amount of money that Mr. Liddy had received was uh, the critical issue at that point. Uh, there must have been some knowledge on somebody's part that uh, this was where the focus was next coming, and I think it was an attempt to resolve that issue prior to questioning uh, coming up uh, independently on individuals. Well, I believe you stated that he had asked you at this meeting to uh, go to see Mr. Titus and uh, to tell Mr. Titus that you had uh, only dispersed approximately 40000 to Mr. Liddy. Is that correct? Yes, sir. That's my best recollection. And in what context did this conversation arise with respect to going to Mr. Titus with this information? Uh, the... He merely suggested the going down to Mr. Titus in the tail end of that proposition, the idea of getting together to resolve the issue at one time. Uh, the suggestion about the figure came up again. He didn't tell you that Mr. Titus uh, had asked him to invite you to go to the U.S. Attorney's Office, did he? I'm not aware of that, sir. I'm, I'm not positive, but I have no knowledge. And you assume that Mr. Magruder was acting on his own? I'm not sure of that, sir. I mean, there was, there was no indication on his part to the contrary, but uh, I'm just not sure in the light of the fact I've made other individuals in the campaign known of his initial approach. That is all, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Rule 25 of the committee provides that any person who is the subject of an investigation in public hearings may submit to the chairman questions in writing for a cross-examination of the witnesses. Their formulation and admissibility shall be decided by the committee in accordance with Rule 24. Now, Rule 24 gives the committee the power to rephrase the questions that are asked. Mr. Robert Barker, who is counsel for Mr. Stans, has contacted the committee and asked the committee to put the following questions to, to Mr. Sloan. Uh, Mr. Sloan, you've testified that uh, you checked with Mr. Stans about certain payments to Mr. Porter. Now, this is the first question Mr. Barker wants us to ask you. When did this occur? 
My best recollection, Senator, would have been on the occasion of the first request in the post-April 7th period for funds. I could not place it in a precise date. Sec the second question is, what amounts, if any, were involved? Uh, I do not believe uh, that we even mentioned the precise dollar amount. I think it was an expression of concern on my part whether this was continue to continue in light of both my understanding and Secretary Stanz's understanding that he was no longer to receive funds. I'm not even sure the dollar figure came up. Was anyone else present at the time that you uh, checked with Mr. Stanz about the payments to Mr. Porter? No, sir. Did you check with Mr. Stanz as to any payment to either Liddy or Porter after the time you checked about Magruder's authority to authorize the $83,000 payment to Liddy? Uh, no, sir. I never. I don't believe I ever checked with them on a dollar amount. It was purely the authority. Do you recall uh, what amount of money was uh, with the porter after April the seventh, nineteen seventy-two? Uh, sir, my best recollection of that figure was uh, approximately six thousand dollars. I understand Mr. Porter's recollection of the general accounting office uh, was eleven thousand. I have no reason to dispute that figure. Yes. Now, there's a, another question which Mr. Barker asked, which uh, really is four questions. And relating to uh, pay, uh, payments that uh, you made to Mr. Kambach, Bach. the first is, did you make any payments to Mr. Kambach after February the 15th, 1972? Yes, sir. Second question, this the second subdivision is question, if so, what was the amount of these payments? If I'm really know. not sure, Senator. I, I, they were not tremendous amounts. They, uh, yeah. There may have been two or three at the most. The third uh, subdivision, the question is, what were these payments for, these payments to Mr. Comback after February the 15th, 1972? I have no idea, sir. The fourth subdivision, the question is, were they disclosed on periodic summaries after February the 15th, 1972? Yes, sir. All the funds I handled were covered in that report to Secretary Stans. Yes. Yes, sir. Now, as I understand you, after you had prepared uh, what may be called a, a summation of all of these uh, the burst disbursements, you gave that to Secretary Stans. Yes, sir, I did. Did you make more than one copy? Uh, I may have at the time it was tight, but in light of uh, my understanding, wanted a single copy, whatever copies would have been destroyed at the same time as the and after, and after you had embodied the, the what your record disclosed, the sum total of what your record disclosed in uh, these, this uh, statement that you furnished Mr. Stans while you destroyed your, your records. Yes, sir. Yes. Now, you testified, as I recall, that you had, or rather, when did you have this, uh, you, you testified on the examination of, uh, of Senator Gurney and Senator Weicker and Senator want to tell you about a conversation you had with Mr. Holman. Yes, sir. When did that occur? Uh, I probably could find a precise date. Uh, I neglected to look it up last night, well, and I apologize, but my best recollection would be towards the end of uh, January, early February, somewhere in that point. This year? Uh, yes, sir. It was while I was a consultant at the Finance Committee. Where did it occur? Uh, in Mr. Holman's office at the White House. Now, in that conversation, Mr. You, you've stated that Mr. Holloman told you that he uh, had uh, nothing to do with uh, the Watergate affair. Yes, sir. But he told you that he knew about uh, the Segretti matter, and that when the Segretti matter was revealed, that it would be under understandable. Yes, sir. Where's that effect? Yes, sir. Well, it's, and that occurred in January this year. January, early February. So far as you know, has Mr. Holloman ever revealed anything about the Segretti matter uh, to the general public or anybody else? Uh, not that I'm aware of, sir. Do you know anything about, uh, well, you know what the expression is, laundering checks means? Oh, what expression, sir? Laundering checks. Uh, I've read the term numerous uh, times, Senator. I, I do not have any precise uh, knowledge of what that term means. Do you know whether any of the checks that were received by the committee were sent out to some person uh, in uh, uh, in uh, Beth Bethesda or Silver Springs or somewhere in the environs of Washington to be uh, 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 converted into cash and returned to the committee? 
Uh, Senator, I, be I believe what you're referring to there is in the early period, uh, Mr. Magruder asked me to set up uh, essentially what was an agency account with uh, Mr. Henry Buchanan, a uh, CPA who was doing work for us. Uh, he, I understood that a certain portion of this money, and I think it was something in the neighborhood of $2,000 a month, uh, went to supplement the salary of Ken Reitz. Uh, I do not know what the balance went for. As I recall, uh, there was quite an argument uh, at that point, uh, and I've forgotten the participants or where the final authority came from. But I recall objecting to the concept of uh, a separate fund out of the hands of the Finance Committee. Now, am I correct in inferring from your testimony that the, the objectives of the disbursements of the funds which you paid out under the uh, authority of Mr. Kahnbach, Mr. Mitchell, and Mr. Magruder was determined by either by them or by the recipients of those funds? Yes, sir. And not by Mr. Stans or you? Uh, not by myself, and to the best of my knowledge, not by Mr. Stans. And so uh, those are the men or the recipients of those funds would be the people who knew, would know where those fun what th was done with those funds. Yes, sir. I would say with one exception, uh, Mr. Stans was, and I were involved in the, the Lankler item of $50,000. That was a finance matter, I would say, with the, and the Clement Stone matter as well. But the, the other matters, that would be correct. Well, I can't, I can't give any retroactive advice to the men who are responsible for disbursing funds for political purposes and concealing the objectives of the disbursements. But I can suggest to future people who are tempted to do that, that when they do, they may be either rightly or wrongly judged by the standards set out in the scriptures where it says, men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. Mr. Chairman. That's the sense maker. Mr. Chairman, I have one additional question or line of questions, and I apologize to the committee and to Mr. Sloan, but when you have a good witness, you try to get as much information as you can. In reviewing the testimony that you've given to the committee and in anticipating some of the testimony I expect we may receive from other witnesses later, I've tried to establish areas where there might be potential conflicts or where there might be elements of uncertainty or uh, incomplete explanation of either statements or the conduct of people. Now, with that preamble, let me point to two or three things I'd like to ask you about, and I frankly confess in advance that I'm asking you for subjective answers. I think it's impossible to give an objective answer. I'm concerned at this moment for a clear definition of the quality and the scope of your warnings or your expressions of concern to Mr. Chapin, to Mr. Ehrlichman, to Mr. Haldeman, to Mr. Mitchell. I have only a sketchy uh, picture of what was said. And therefore, all I can ask you to do, in addition to what you've already said, is give me some appraisal of the quality of that warning. Was it a stern, intensive sort of thing, or was it a casual expression of a vague uneasiness? Now, between those two, if you can help me on this scale of subjectivity, I'd be grateful. Uh, Senator, with the regard to the Chapin and Ehrlichman matters, I think they essentially fall in the same category. Uh, as I've tried to point out, uh, I have a very great deal of trouble uh, putting together my precise state of mind, what factors were affecting that at that point in time. The nature of those meetings were, as in the case with Mr. Haldeman, uh, extremely cordial. They're men I consider my friends. Uh, we talked over a range of other things. The introduction uh, in each case was about families, uh, vacations, the uh, uh, social amenities and so forth. Uh, I would say, probably just because it's not my character, I, I do not believe that I made the hard sell anywhere. I think I said, geez, I just think there's a problem. Uh, I, I do not believe at that point in time, and I'm not sure of the precise sequences even whether 
In fact, Mr. Magruder had even made his approach to me at that point. So what, I, what I'm saying is that there was certainly no uh, – uh, it was not a warning in the sense of substantive information. I think it was a uh, expression of personal concern that perhaps I, maybe I, because of how I felt, uh, assumed that these gentlemen would intuitively pick that up and perhaps run with the ball from there. Uh, I cannot characterize these meetings as something where I said, gee, you guys got to do something about this specific problem or else I'm going to do something about it. It was not that kind of a proposition. It was very low-key and cordial. I'm sure you understand why I asked that Yes, question. sir, I do. Because at some future time, yes, sir. this committee presumably will have to judge the likelihood or the appropriateness of the conduct of others in response to the information you imparted, your frame of mind, and your attitude, and the quality and the scope of your warnings or admonitions. Yes, sir. So it's important for me to know that quality, that subjective quality of concern, as it relates to the future testimony of, say, Mr. Chapin, Mr. Ehrlichman, Mr. Haldeman, Mr. Mitchell, and Mr. Stans. Yes, sir, I understand that. Does the description you've given us, which obviously is subject to many interpretations, but does the description of the general type warning fit all of these meetings, or were there variations of it, say, with Mr. Mitchell or with Mr. Ehrlichman or Mr. Haldeman? Uh, of course, in the, the case of Mr. Haldeman, this was sort of after the fact. Uh, it wasn't uh, a warning situation at all. It was merely a, you know, it's all over. I'm going my way. Uh, I want to pass through on the way out uh, to be sure that you understand why I did what I've done. And as far as I was concerned, somebody somewhere had already made their decision between me and how they were going to go on this matter. It was a moot point. So I don't think there's any... Uh, uh, he, for instance, uh, in that meeting, uh, discussed Mr. Chapin and, and what a difficult decision it had been for him, uh, a man who had been very close to the power and uh, to the president personally, which I had not been, uh, to make the decision uh, to go into the private sector. But we discussed this in terms of the proper age for a young man who is not, because of being in a appointed position with a partisan administration, is not a career government official, that you have to make a personal decision at some point uh, where you're going to provide in the long term for your family. Sloan, I think I understand your point of view, and just for the sake of time, I'm going to ask one final question that is even more patently subjective, but uh, the committee will weigh it for whatever it's worth if you can answer it. The questions I've asked so far on this subject obviously lead to one master question, and that is, in your judgment, did the men to whom you talked, Mr. Chapin, Mr. Ehrlichman, Mr. Haldeman, Mr. Stans, Mr. Mitchell, Mr. McGruder, did the man to whom you talked respond in your judgment in an appropriate way to the quality or the intensity of your admonition, warning, or conversation? Uh, Senator, if I could, I would, I would answer that question in uh, terms of how problems within a campaign are normally addressed. Uh, I mean, it's not only for me, but it was quite clear that Potentially, there was uh, great damage coming to the campaign, just to, by nothing else, guilt by association, because the campaign's a very logical place to look for suspects in a case of a bugging of the opposing party's uh, headquarters. But the thing that disturbed me it, it's, uh, was the not negative response, but lack of positive response, in the sense that if you had a problem about gift tax, you'd get all the appropriate people on the committee together and sit down and talk about it. As far as I know, in view of the knowledge I had about the money, I could not believe at some point in time you didn't have a situation develop where more than two people were in a room at any one time. I think uh, it, this creates a climate. You begin to uh, you go through this, perhaps suspect what might be going on. I, I, don't, I don't know whether that's characterized it very well, but it just did not seem to be a normal response given the nature of the problem. Well, I, I'm not sure that your, your, your response is at least as good as my question, so we'll let it, <laughs> we'll let it, we'll let it stay there, Mr. Sloan. You, you dropped one little pearl there that I can't resist picking up when you said the bugging of each other's headquarters. Do you have any oh, information no, about that? That was a slip. I have All no right. knowledge. Of that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. Senator Nolan, you have another public question. Senator Garner. Senator Montoya. Senator White. 
Then I'll, I would suggest that we close with letting the council and the minority council ask whatever questions they may have in addition to those been asked. Mr. Sloan, I just have two questions. You may have misunderstood Senator Montoya's question to you concerning any efforts by anybody other than Magruder to have you testify differently than you believe was the truth. Uh, you did say to Senator, or answer Senator Montoya that with regard to Mr. LaRue's conversations with you, that you believe he may have had a uh, honest belief that there was a difference of opinion as to the amount. Uh, let me just refer you to your testimony yesterday in response to a question put by me to you concerning conversation you had with Mr. LaRue after you had had your interview with the FBI. And let me just read your uh, testimony from page 1248 and 1249 of the transcript. You had just come back from your interview with the FBI, and you stated, I believe Mr. LaRue came down to my office following that interview essentially to find out what I said and what matters came up. At that point, he indicated to me, and I do not have the precise words, the sense of the meaning as it came across to me, there was very brief reference, something to the effect that the Liddy money is the problem. It is very political sensitive. We can just not come out with a high figure. We are going to have to come out with a different figure. And I said, as I recall, I said, if there is a problem, I cannot see it makes any difference whether it is $200 or $200,000, or $200, at which point he dropped the conversation. Is that a correct statement? Uh, yes, sir. I, uh, I guess it's a question of degree that in the case of Mr. Magruder, it was uh, a very hard sell, blatant kind of approach. Uh, in the case of Mr. LaRue, it was very uh, low key and he backed off it very fast. Uh, but that is a correct statement, uh, at the best of my knowledge, of the sense of that meeting. Now, Mr. Sloan, also the early part of your testimony, you did mention the name Francis Rain as a person who was a co signer, I understand of the, one of the cash safety deposit boxes. Do you have of your own knowledge or any information as to uh, whether Mr. Rain is related to Mr. Holderman? Uh, yes, sir. I do not believe I knew it at the time. I've uh, since been told that he is a relative. I'm not sure by whom. I understand it's a brother-in-law relationship. I have no further questions of Mr. Sloan, but I think for the record, the Dahlberg check uh, which was dated April 10, 1972, uh, drawn on the first bank and trust company of Boca Raton in the amount of $25,000, uh, had already been identified by you, Mr. Sloan, and, but it has never uh, been marked as an exhibit, and I would like to uh, have it given to the reporter to mark as an exhibit and introduced in evidence. I have no further questions, Mr. Chairman. No, the, the reporter will um, number the check uh, a copy of the check uh, given an appropriate number and be received as an exhibit. Um, <clears throat> Mr. Sloan, um, I want to thank you on behalf of the committee for your appearance here. I want to thank you for the in intellectual integrity which you have uh, displayed throughout your examination and for the very forthright, forthright manner in which you have testified. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. You're excused now, subject to be recalled uh, if the committee later finds it necessary to do so. Thank you, but sir. Thank you very much. The committee will stand in recess till 2 o'clock unless some member of the committee objects. Thus, after almost seven hours of testimony, the Senate committee has completed its examination of Hugh Sloan. And Sloan indicated that although he was very upset about some of the people around him, he did not lose faith in President Nixon or his programs. In a moment, we'll have testimony from one of the men Sloan gave large amounts of cash to, Herbert Porter. Public television's coverage of the Watergate hearings will continue after this pause for station identification. Unabridged coverage of these hearings is provided as a public service by the member stations of PBS, the Public Broadcasting Service.
From Washington, NPACT continues its coverage of hearings by the Senate Select Committee on Presidential Campaign Activities. Here again, correspondent Jim Lehrer. As soon as Senator Urban gavels the committee back to order after a lunch break, Herbert Porter will be questioned by Assistant Committee Counsel David Dorson. The committee will come to all of I understand the first to witness will be Mr. Porter. We intend to recall Mr. Porter at a later date, and it's the hope of the chairman that at this time we will only go in to question him about uh, his uh, knowledge or lack of knowledge of the bugging and uh, breaking of the Watergate and any alleged attempts to cover up the, that episode. The counsel will call the witness. Yes, uh, Mr. Herbert Porter, would you please take the witness chair? Mr. Porter, will you stand up and raise your right hand? Do you swear that the evidence which you shall give to the Senate Select Committee on Presidential Campaign Activities shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? I do, so help you Thank God. You. Mr. Chairman, Mr. David Dorson, Assistant Chief Counsel, will ask the opening questions of this witness. Uh, Mr. Porter, could you please give your full name and address? Yes, sir. My name is Herbert Lloyd Porter, and my present address is 32451 Mediterranean Drive, Laguna Niguel, California. Uh, Mr. Porter, I see you're represented by counsel. Could counsel please identify himself? Charles B. Murray is my name, sir. Uh, Mr. Porter, I understand that you have a brief opening statement. Could you please make it at this time? I do, sir. Thank you. My full name is Herbert Lloyd Porter. I am also known as Bart Porter. I was born and reared in California. I served two years as an officer in the United States Marine Corps after which I spent seven and one-half years in the marketing of data processing computers and software. Having never been involved in any political campaign or other political activity, I was both honored and excited at the opportunity to help in some way toward the re-election of Richard Nixon to a second term in the White House. Prior to joining the Committee for the Re-election of the President in May 1971, I served a brief period in the White House working in the office of the Director of the Communications, Herbert G. Klein. My function at the Committee for the Re-election of the President was to organize the surrogate candidate program. My title was Director of Scheduling. I was also responsible for organizing all celebrities, entertainers, and athletes for the campaign. Almost all my time while at the Committee for the Re-election of the President was spent organizing and directing the activities of these several groups. Stories have appeared in both newspapers and magazines mentioning my name in connection with what has come to be known as Watergate. A few of these stories have been fairly accurate, some half true, while others have been totally false. The record will show that I have made no comments to any reporters or newsmen over the past several months. This may or may not have been wise on my part, but I was trying the best I knew how to protect my wife and my three children from the consequences of any excess publicity. I have cooperated fully with both the federal prosecutors and members of the investigative staff of this committee, and I have made full disclosure to them. I also wish to state that in cooperating with both the federal prosecutors and this committee, I did so voluntarily, and in the case of the federal prosecutors, I appeared at my own request. At no time did I ever seek immunity from either group, nor did I authorize my lawyer to do so. I have made no deals. I have agreed only to tell the truth. I will answer all questions put to me by this committee regarding testimony heretofore given by me. At no time did I ever have any intention of covering up a criminal act. At no time did I knowingly engage in any cover-up of the Watergate burglary. I had no prior knowledge of the Watergate burglary, and up to this very moment, I have no knowledge of the involvement of others. 
I have been guilty of a deep sense of loyalty to the President of the United States. The facts will speak for themselves. Finally, may I say that this whole affair has had a most devastating effect on my personal life. Because of the unfavorable publicity, I have been terminated from a lucrative position in private industry, a fact which in turn has caused me to forfeit at substantial loss the purchase of a new home in California where I was born and planned to live. This is my situation, Mr. Chairman. I am now ready to answer any and all questions to the best of my ability. Mr. Porter, in your opening statement, you referred to the surrogate candidate program. Could you please explain what that program entailed? Yes, sir. Very briefly, uh, the surrogate candidate program was a program that involved the, uh, the efforts of about 35 congressmen, senators, governors, cabinet officials, a mayor, uh, who would appear on behalf of the president during the primaries and during the campaign. The purpose of the program was to look at that group as a resource and to maximize it through scheduling and uh, certain campaign appearances uh, on behalf of the President. Mr. Porter, while you were at the committee, did you know G. Gordon Liddy? I did, sir. And in connection with your duties at the committee, were you ever asked to give cash to Mr. Liddy? Uh, yes, sir, I was. And who asked you to do this? Uh, Mr. Jeb Magruder. When was the first time he so asked you? Uh, in December of 1971. And what did Magruder, Mr. Magruder tell you? Mr. Magruder told me that Mr. Liddy was going to be taking on dirty tricks and other special projects and that Mr. Liddy would be coming to me from time to time to request funds and that I was to in turn ask Mr. Sloan for the funds and turn them over to Mr. Liddy. Did Mr. Liddy, in fact, come to you for funds? He did. On how many occasions? I would say probably seven or eight occasions. And what was the approximate amount you furnished Mr. Liddy on each of those occasions? Uh, the amounts varied, uh, Mr. Dorson, probably for anywhere from uh, $500 uh, all the way up to uh, one time, I think, $6,000 he requested. It was usually in the two to $3,000 category, as I remember. Prior to uh, April 7, 1972, how much in total did you furnish, Mr. Liddy? Uh, approximately $30,000 to $35,000, probably closer to, to the $30,000 figure, 30, 31, 32. Now, in March of 1972, Mr. Liddy uh, changed positions, is that correct? Yes, sir, that's correct. And what was the change? Uh, Mr. Liddy uh, left his duties as general counsel of the Committee for the Re-election of the President and became general counsel of the Finance Committee to re-elect the President. Uh, how many of the payments which you have... A few of these stories have been fairly accurate, some half true, while others have been totally false. The record will show that I have made no comments to any reporters or newsmen over the past several months. This may or may not have been wise on my part, but I was trying the best I knew how to protect my wife and my three children from the consequences of any excess publicity. I have cooperated fully with both the federal prosecutors and members of the investigative staff of this committee, and I have made full disclosure to them. I also wish to state that in cooperating with both the federal prosecutors and this committee, I did so voluntarily 
and in the case of the federal prosecutors, I appeared at my own request. At no time did I ever seek immunity from either group, nor did I authorize my lawyer to do so. I have made no deals. I have agreed only to tell the truth. I will answer all questions put to me by this committee regarding testimony heretofore given by me. At no time did I ever have any intention of covering up a criminal act. At no time did I knowingly engage in any cover-up of the Watergate burglary. I had no prior knowledge of the Watergate burglary, and up to this very moment, I have no knowledge of the involvement of others. I have been guilty of a deep sense of loyalty to the President of the United States. The facts will speak for themselves. Finally, may I say that this whole affair has had a most devastating effect on my personal life. Because of the unfavorable publicity, I have been terminated from a lucrative position in private industry, a fact which in turn has caused me to forfeit at substantial loss the purchase of a new home in California where I was born and planned to live. This is my situation, Mr. Chairman. I am now ready to answer any and all questions to the best of my ability. Mr. Porter, in your opening statement, you referred to the surrogate candidate program. Could you please explain what that program entailed? Yes, sir. Very briefly, uh, the surrogate candidate program was a program that involved the, uh, the efforts of about 35 congressmen, senators, governors, cabinet officials, a mayor, uh, who would appear on behalf of the president during the primaries and during the campaign. The purpose of the program was to look at that group as a resource and to maximize it through scheduling and uh, certain campaign appearances uh, on behalf of the president. Mr. Porter, while you were at the committee, did you know G. Gordon Liddy? I did, sir. And in connection with your duties at the committee, were you ever asked to give cash to Mr. Liddy? Uh, yes, sir, I was. And who asked you to do this? Uh, Mr. Jeb Magruder. When was the first time he so asked you? Uh, in December of 1971. And what did Magruder, Mr. Magruder tell you? Mr. Magruder told me that Mr. Liddy was going to be taking on dirty tricks and other special projects, and that Mr. Liddy would be coming to me from time to time to request funds, and that I was to, in turn, ask Mr. Sloan for the funds and turn them over to Mr. Liddy. Did Mr. Liddy, in fact, come to you for funds? He did. On how many occasions? I would say probably seven or eight occasions. And what was the approximate amount you furnished Mr. Liddy on each of those occasions? Uh, the amounts varied, uh, Mr. Dorson, probably for anywhere from uh, $500 uh, all the way up to uh, one time, I think, $6,000 he requested. It was usually in the two to $3,000 category, as I remember. Prior to uh, April 7th, 1972, how much in total did you furnish, Mr. Liddy? Uh, approximately thirty to thirty-five thousand dollars, probably closer to to the thirty thousand dollar figure, thirty, thirty-one, thirty-two. Now, in March of 1972, Mr. Liddy uh, changed positions. Is that correct? Yes, sir. That's correct. And what was the change? Uh, Mr. Liddy uh, left his duties as general counsel of the Committee for the Re-election of the President and became general counsel of the Finance Committee to re-elect the President. Uh, how many of the payments which you have described occurred after he went to the Finance Committee? I'm sorry, I misunderstood your first question. When I answered the uh, $30,000 to $35,000 figure, that was up to April 7th. There was an additional payment after April 7th that occurred in the early part of May 1972 uh, in the net amount of $3,300, which would, should be added to the other figure. And when you say net amount, what do you mean? Sir? By net amount. Uh, net amount means that uh, I gave Mr. Liddy $5,300, and he returned $2,000 of that $5,300 the next day. Uh, did Mr. Liddy ever give you receipts for the money you gave him? Uh, yes, sir, he did. Did Mr. Liddy ever give you anything else? Uh, yes, sir, he did. What was that? I would say on three or four occasions, Mr. Liddy handed me uh, 
white, large, uh, regular letter size envelopes sealed on the back with his initials written over the, over the seal uh, and asked me to keep them uh, in my safe in my office. He instructed me that if anything should ever happen to him, that I was to take those directly to the Attorney General. And who was the Attorney General? Uh, Mr. Mitchell. Did there ever come a time when you took any of these envelopes to Mr. Mitchell? No, sir. Uh, what happened to the envelopes? The envelopes, and I, I've, I've told you this before, I cannot remember whether it was at the end of March or after the, the Watergate break-in. I have a feeling it was at the end of March, but I can't be certain. It was one of the times that I went through and audited my, my cash on hand. Uh, Mr. Liddy came by and he said, you know those envelopes I gave you or that you're holding for me? I said, yes. He said, why don't you, he said, go ahead and shred them. Um, I did that and in doing so, I, they were stuffed full of uh, paper of some kind and would not go through a shredder without looking inside. Did you open the envelopes? I did. I opened, I opened all of them, yes, sir. And did you see what was inside the envelope? Yes, sir, I did, generally. And what did you see? Um, I determined very quickly that they were uh, very similar to a, a salesman's receipts if he went on a trip, uh, a, uh, an airline ticket, a parking ticket, a, uh, uh, a restaurant uh, stub, uh, that kind of thing. And so I didn't, I didn't bother to see, look and inspect each one. I, there were no memos in them. Um, I do remember, I think one of the airline tickets was from Washington to Los Angeles and back, I think. Did you ever discuss uh, the contents of the envelopes with Mr. Liddy? No, sir, I did not. Did you ever discuss the contents of the envelopes with Mr. Mitchell? No, sir, I did not. Um, Mr. Porter, prior to April 7th, 1972, how much money did you receive from Hugh Sloan? Approximately $52,000. How much of this did you disperse? Approximately $49,500. After April 7, 1972, how much money did you receive from Hughes Loan? Approximately $17,000. And how much did you disperse? To all of it. How did you, or how do you now uh, arrive at the figures which you have just given us? Well, sir, I, uh, I've had ample opportunity to go back and, uh, and recall as best I know how uh, each, or each of the transactions in which I went and got money from Mr. Sloan and, and gave it to others. Um, and to the best of my ability, I have come up with those figures. And is it your uh, best recollection and knowledge that you received from Mr. Sloan a total of approximately $69,000? Yes, sir. That's a to the best of my knowledge. Mr. Porter, uh, when did you first become aware of the uh, break-in at the Watergate? Uh, Saturday, June 17th, uh, in Los Angeles, California. And briefly, how did you become aware? Well, sir, uh, I was, that was a, a weekend in which we were having a, a large uh, party at a private residence in California for a lot of the celebrities uh, who were going to be supporting the president during the campaign. Um, and it was on that trip uh, that um, apparently the word, um, the news broke Saturday morning here and was relayed to, uh, to some of the campaign officials with whom I was traveling at the time. And um, I learned it from them. Following uh, the break-in at the Watergate, uh, did you have a conversation with Mr. Jeb Magruder concerning any statements you might make to the Federal Bureau of Investigation? Yes, sir, I did. Where and when did this conversation occur? I would say that approximately 10 or 11 days, I'm not sure of the exact date, whether it was June 28th or the 29th, but in that time frame, uh, Mr. Magruder asked me to come into his office, which I did. He shut the door, and um, he told me that he had just come from a meeting with Mr. Mitchell, Mr. LaRue, himself, and a fourth party whose name I cannot remember. 
where my name had been brought up as someone who could be, uh, what was the term he used, uh, counted on in a pinch or a team player or something, words to that effect. Excuse me for interrupting, Mr. Porter, but you are now recounting what Mr. Magruder told you. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Please continue. He said that, uh, uh, I believe at that time, Mr. Liddy had been fired from the campaign. Uh, he said it was uh, apparent, that was the word he used, that, uh, that Mr. Liddy and, and others had, uh, on their own, illegally um, participated in the break-in of the Watergate Democratic National Committee. And Mr. Magruder swore to me that neither he nor anybody higher than Mr. Liddy in, in the campaign organization or at the White House had any involvement whatsoever in Watergate, in the Watergate uh, break-in, and reinforced that by saying, doesn't that sound like something stupid that Gordon would do? And uh, I, uh, you have to know, Mr. Liddy, I agreed with that. Um, <laughs> I, uh, he said, I want to assure you now that, that, that no one did. He said, however, um, he said, uh, there is a problem with some of the money. He said, now, uh, Gordon was authorized money for some dirty tricks. Nothing illegal, he said, but nonetheless, things that could be very embarrassing to the President of the United States, and to Mr. Mitchell, and to Mr. Haldeman, and others. Um, now, your name was brought up as someone who we can count on to, to help in this situation. And I asked, what is it you're asking me to do? And he said, would you corroborate a story that the money was authorized for something a little bit more legitimate sounding than dirty tricks. Even though the dirty tricks were legal, it still would be very embarrassing. Now, he said, you're aware that the Democrats have filed a civil suit against this committee. I said, yes, I've read that in the paper. And he said, do you know what immediate discovery is? And I said, no, I do not. And he said, well, they may get immediate discovery, which means that they can come in any minute and swoop in on our committee and take all the files and subpoena all the records, and you know what, that, what would happen if they did that. Um, I conjured up in my mind that scene and, and became rather excitable, and uh, uh, no, I didn't want to see that. Um, so uh, I said, well, be specific, and he said, well, you were in charge of the surrogate campaign. He said, you were very concerned about uh, radical elements uh, disrupting rallies and so forth. And I said, yes. And he said, suppose that we had authorized Liddy, instead of the dirty tricks, that we'd authorized him to uh, infiltrate uh, some of these radical groups. He said, how could such a program have cost $100,000? And I thought very quickly, uh, conversation I'd had with a young man in California in December, as a matter of fact. And I said, uh, I said, Jeb, that's very easy. I said, uh, you could get uh, 10 college-age students or, or 24, 25-year-old students, um, people, uh, over a period of 10 months, uh, Mr. Gruder had prefaced his remark by saying from December on, um, and I said, you could pay them $1,000 a month which they would take their expenses out of that. And I said, that's $100,000. I said, that's not very much for a $45 million campaign. And he said, no, that's, that's right. He said, um, would you be willing, if I made that statement to the federal or to the FBI, would you be willing to corroborate that when I came to you in December and asked you how much it would cost, that that's what you said? That was the net effect of his question. That was the net of his question. And uh, I thought for a moment, and I, I said, yes, I, I probably would do that. I, I, I don't remember saying yes, but I'm sure I gave Mr. Magruder the impression that I would probably do that. That was the end of the conversation. Now, Mr. Porter, did the 
conversation you agreed to tell the FBI actually take place? Sir? Did the conversation which you agreed with Mr. Magruder that you would tell to the FBI actually take place in December of 1971? No, sir, it did not take place in December. Later, did you tell the FBI what Mr. Magruder asked you to tell them? Yes, sir, I did. And subsequent to that, did you appear at a federal, before a federal grand jury? Yes, sir. And uh, were you asked about the surrogate candidate program? Yes, sir. And what did you tell the federal grand jury? Same thing, sir. And were you a witness at the trial of the seven defendants who yes, were sir. indicted in the Watergate case? Yes, sir. And did you give the same account? Yes, sir, I did. Did Mr. Magruder ask you to make any other statements which you knew to be false? Yes, sir, he did. And what did he ask you? Shortly after that, he asked me to, uh, if I would increase the amount of money that I was going to say that I gave to Mr. Liddy. And I said, no, I wouldn't do that. And he said, why not? And I said, because I just absolutely, I didn't give him that amount of money, and I won't say I gave him that amount of money. I said, the conversation that you're asking me to relate, I can conceive of it happening because I would have told you that in December if you'd asked me. And it's uh, a strange answer, but that's the answer I gave him. And I would not increase the amount of money. I, he wanted me to say that I gave Mr. Liddy $75,000, when in fact I had given him some Thirty to thirty-five thousand, thirty-two thousand. Did Mr. Magruder tell you why uh, he wanted the higher figure? No, sir, he did not. Uh, when was the first time you told any investigatory body that you had not testified truthfully at the grand jury and at the trial? Uh, April eighteenth, I believe. Nineteen seventy-three. Nineteen seventy-three. Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I have no further questions at this time. We, uh, we have a vote on in the Senate, and so it be necessary for us to take a recess to the members of the committee can go and vote. The senators took a break after following some of the most startling testimony of the whole eight days of the hearings. Herbert Porter has just indicated that he helped set up a cover story at the direction of Jeb Stuart Magruder. As the committee pauses for a vote on amendments to an agriculture bill, we'd like to thank you, the viewers, for your overwhelming response to these broadcasts. We've received more than 70,000 letters, almost 99% of them in favor of this primetime replay. We'd like to encourage viewers who might still want to offer opinions to let your local public television stations know. That's the station you're watching right now. Drop them a card or letter. Or, if you're so inclined, maybe drop them a check, because local stations depend on you to keep them in business and on the air. They're interested in your response, as well as your help. Public television's coverage of the hearings will continue after this pause for station identification. Unabridged coverage of these hearings is provided as a public service by the member stations of PBS, the Public Broadcasting Service.
From Washington, NPACT continues its coverage of hearings by the Senate Select Committee on Presidential Campaign Activities. Here again, correspondent Robert McNeil. When the hearings resumed, it was the turn of minority counsel Fred Thompson to go over Herbert Porter's reasons for his apparent perjury at the Watergate trial. Thompson. Ms. Porter, as I understand it, your statement here this morning is to the effect that you agreed with Mr. Magruder that you would tell the grand jury a false story. Is that correct? What I agreed to specifically, Mr. Thompson, in, was that I would agree initially to corroborate uh, a story that Mr. Magruder was going to tell to the FBI, uh, which I felt was, uh, in effect, replacing a one uh, lawful authorization for another lawful authorization. Was it or was it not a false story? No, oh, yes, uh, absolutely correct. It was a false statement. All right. Then you you gave this false statement to the grand jury. Yes, sir. And you gave it at the trial in January. Yes, sir. And when did you go to the proper authorities and tell them the truth about these matters? Uh, the appointment was on April 18th at the U.S. Attorney's Office, although the contact had been made earlier than that, or the uh, when contact was, to set up an appointment. When was the contact made? I believe the, the 15th. 15th? Yes, sir. What caused you to, to go to them and make that contact? Um, to answer that question, Mr. Thompson, would, uh, in its context, would really cause me to go back to April 9th. Um, when Mr. Magruder called me in New York, at where I was employed, and stated that uh, things weren't looking too good for him. And I said, what do you mean? And he said, uh, well, let me just say that things are getting a little hot down here. And I said, well, Jeb, I don't know what you mean by that. I said, you've always uh, indicated to me that you were not involved in any of these matters. And he said, that's right. And I said, I don't, I don't want you to go into anything, but uh, uh, he said, well, I'll, I'll keep you up to date or keep you up to speed or words to that effect. He called me on Wednesday and on April 11th and said, Bart, uh, if I were you, uh, I would call Paul O'Brien who was one of the lawyers for the committee, and tell him to call Earl Silbert and go down and tell Earl what you know. Um, I said, uh, Jeb, you realize you're asking me to, um, in effect, to put one of your feet in a six feet deep hole. He said, yes, I know that, but he said, I got you into this, and uh, he said, the least I can do is help you get out of it. So I called Mr. O'Brien on the telephone. When? This was on April 11th. And I told him that I, I had had a conversation with Mr. Magruder, and I told him that I wanted him to call Mr. Silbert, and that I wanted to go talk to Mr. Silbert. And Mr. O'Brien's response to me was, now what do you want to go do a stupid thing like that for? And I said, well, um, I just do. And he said, well, now just you sound a little rattled, just calm down a little. Uh, he said, when are you going to be back down in Washington? I was commuting at the time. My family was here. And I said, well, I'll, I'll be in uh, uh, tomorrow evening, Thursday evening, April 12th. He said, well, why don't you come in and see me on Friday? 
13th, and we'll, let's talk about it. Um, and so I, I did, and uh, we, uh, in, during the afternoon, Mr. Uh, O'Brien uh, alternately said, gee, I don't know whether you have a problem here or not. Uh, he was very tired. He, in fact, uh, fell asleep a couple of times during our conversation. Um, <laughs> He, uh, and I, I don't say that jokingly, the man was exhausted, in my opinion. Um, uh, I wasn't, uh, so uh, he, he said, well, I, I think maybe we ought to get another opinion here. So he called Mr. Parkinson on the telephone, and uh, uh, there was a brief pause, and he said, yeah, I'll tell him that. So he said, Parkinson uh, thinks you should tell the truth. And I said, yes, that's what I called you about two days ago. And he said, well, I really, I, I don't know what to tell you. I, I just, we, we still need, I'm, he hemmed and hawed. I, he then got a phone call from Mr. Magruder, who was over at his attorney's office. And uh, they conversed briefly. And I, and he said, yeah, I'll tell Porter that. That's a good idea. So he hung up and he said, you go over and talk to Magruder's lawyer. At this point, I did not have any counsel. He said, except Mr. Parkinson and Mr. O'Brien. And he said, you, you go over and talk to uh, Magruder's lawyer and see what he thinks you ought to do. So I went over to uh, the office of Mr. Uh, James Sharp and uh, spoke briefly with him. I would say no more than 10 minutes. Same day? Same day, yes, sir. This is the afternoon of the 13th now. And. Uh, I explained very quickly uh, what I've just explained to you gentlemen here, and uh, he looked at me uh, rather incredulously, and he said, my God, he said, you're an ant. He said, you're a nothing. He said, uh, do you realize the whole history of the, uh, the whole course of history is going to be changed? And I said, no, I, I didn't realize that, um, but I knew what my worries were. And he said, do you, um, he said, I can't advise you. He said, do you have an attorney? I said, no. He said, do you know any? And I said, well, yes, but I, I don't know anybody that might be able to handle anything like this or be involved. I said, I would want somebody that you would know. He said, I'll call you late tonight, later on this evening, and uh, give you a couple of names. You have, you talk to the, an attorney and have him call me. And uh, he said, uh, now, if Mr. Magruder is going to go down and talk to the federal prosecutors, he said, we would certainly give you the courtesy of going down first. And I said, well, I would appreciate that very much. Why? Uh, I th think because uh, Mr. Magruder is the one who uh, got me involved. And it was Mr. Magruder's feeling, at least he indicated to me, that he wanted to do everything he could do to, uh, to extricate me from, from that situation. So... Uh, Mr. Sharp did call me that evening about 10, 10 Wouldn't it have been night. better from your standpoint sure. if you had come forth with this information first? Sir? Wouldn't it have been better from your standpoint if you had come forth with this information first, in your own eyes, instead of having Magruder go down there and you, then you coming in No, sir, later? I'm explaining. Perhaps you didn't understand me. I'm explaining that Mr. Sharp said to me, if Magruder is going to go down to the U.S. Attorney's office, we would certainly give you the courtesy of going first, You're going, uh, he said to me. All right. All right. Uh, and I agreed with that. And um, so he called me later that evening, about 10.15, on Friday evening, Mr. Sharp did, and gave me the name of two or three lawyers here in Washington. Uh, Mr. Murray was on that list. Um, and said, have him call me. The following Saturday afternoon, the next day, when I ran into Mr. Magruder across from St. John's Church at 5 o'clock in the afternoon, uh, among other things, he told me that he had been to the U.S. Attorney's Office that morning, Saturday morning. And I was rather stunned by that. And I said, how did that happen? And he said, well, Jim Sharp called me last night and said that he had set up an appointment with Earl Silbert for 8.30 this morning and instructed me absolutely not to call anybody or discuss it with anyone. I'm sorry, he said. So, In other words, uh, <clears throat> Mr. Magruder didn't do what Mr. Sharp suggested that he do. Mr. Magruder did not call me, sir, and tell me that he was going down. Mm -hmm. no, he followed Mr. Sharp's instructions according to what he said. 
Mr. So that I, Mr. Sharp told him what again? Mr. Sharp, Mr. Magruder told me Saturday afternoon that his lawyer, Jim Sharp, had called him the night before mm -hmm. and had told him that he had made an appointment for Mr. Magruder to see the federal prosecutors the next morning, Saturday morning, April, April 14th, at 8.30 in the morning, and instructed Mr. Magruder, according to Mr. Magruder now, not to contact anybody or call anybody or discuss his meeting with anybody at all. And so, so Mr. Sharp didn't abide by the agreement that you and he had had? Well, in my opinion, no, sir. What did Mr. Magruder tell you there at the, on the 14th? Um, Mr. Besides, Mr. besides what you've already released. Yes, sir. Mr. Magruder told me that he had just come from a meeting at the White House and that uh, it's all over, he said. And I said, what do you mean it's all over? And he said, it's all over. He said, uh, the president has directed everybody to tell the truth, were his exact words. Um, he said, uh, I had a meeting with Mr. Ehrlichman, and I told him the whole story, and boy, was he really shocked, or words to that effect. Um, he also told me that he had been to the federal prosecutors that morning. He also told me that there were going to be several indictments and listed off a series of names, number of names, of uh, people that he thought would be indicted. All right, I'm sure that will produce some further questions, but I'll leave it for others uh, on that particular point. Let me ask you this. Did, when is the first time you talked with Mr. O'Brien and Mr. Parkinson about this false story concerning the $100,000 Mr. Lee? I talked to uh, Mr. Parkinson. Well, the way it happened was uh, a few days, I would say maybe two or three days after Mr. McCord's letter to Judge Sirica became, was made public in the latter part of March, Mr. Magruder called me on the phone. I was still in my office at the inaugural committee and said, uh, did you see McCord's letter? And I said, yes, I saw parts of it in the newspaper. And he said, uh, well, what do you think of it? There are words to that effect. And I said, well, I don't, uh, I'm not really concerned about any part of it. I, I said, I don't think he's, he's not talking about me. Uh, and he said, Mr. McGurry said, well, yeah, I guess he isn't, or something like that. He said, oh, by the way, Mr. Parkinson, or Ken Parkinson, wants to talk to you. And I said, what about? And he said, well, I'm not sure, but he said, let me just say one thing. He said, when you do talk to Parkinson, he said, tell him everything. And I said, <clears throat> and I was a little startled at that. I said, all right, I will. Uh, I had occasion. We, we, Mr. Parkinson and I, set up, Mr. he did call me, Mr. Parkinson did, and we set up a, an appointment, I believe it was for 4 o'clock in the afternoon of March 28th. Was this meeting before you went to the grand jury? Sir? Was this meeting before you went to the grand jury? I've only made one grand jury appearance. Mr. When was Thompson, that? August of 1972. All right. Go ahead. Um, so I uh, had occasion to talk to Mr. O'Brien um, before I went to Mr. Parkinson's office, and he asked me to come by his office. I did. I talked to Mr. O'Brien, uh, I would say, for, for an hour, hour and a half in his office, uh, told him my whole story, or the, what I've told this committee. Um, Mr. O'Brien said he didn't think I had a problem. I think was the way he put it. Um, I went to see Mr. Parkinson. Mr. Parkinson uh, began by asking me what I knew about Mr. McCord's letter to Judge Sirica. And I said, well, quite frankly, Ken, I don't I don't see where he's, you know, he's, I can't really shed any light on it at all. Uh, and then I, I said, however, uh, you're aware of, and then I told him about the, uh, about the, the, the false statement, or the statement that was not true. And uh, 
he looked at it. Uh, I believe he had my trial testimony in front of him. I'm not certain of that, however. Uh, I can't be certain. And he, but I do remember him sitting back and he said, well, he said, all you've done is you've just embellished a little. He said, that's all. He said, uh, uh, you haven't got a problem. He said, uh, you have nothing to worry about. I said, uh, well, I felt a little uneasy, although I, I felt better after that. I said, do you, do you think I should have uh, my own attorney? At this, up to this point, Mr. O'Brien and Mr. Uh, Parkinson were uh, in there representing the committee, were made available to uh, anybody who was making FBI appearances or grand jury appearances, et cetera. Uh, and, in this, and in connection with the civil suit filed by the Democrats. And uh, I said, do you think I need my own attorney or my own counsel? And he, th he, said, uh, he said, well, you're certainly, uh, you certainly can. It probably costs you a little money maybe. But he said, I can't, I, I don't see why you need your own counsel. He says, as a matter of fact, Bart, at this point, it would probably be a little disruptive because um, things are you know, kind of coming down to a close and we're, uh, it would take somebody new a long time to, to learn the case. We've been on this thing for uh, many months now and uh, uh, he said, I don't think we have any conflict of interest here representing your interest in this thing at all. So I walked away and, and that was it. So you never discussed the matter of Mr. Parkinson or Mr. O'Brien before August of 72? Um, well, I'm not sure in, in, in what context you're asking. You never question. discussed the story that you were going to tell the grand yes, jury? Yes, I did, sir. Yes, I did. But in a, in a slightly different context, Mr. Back in, in July, or late June, early July of 72, Mr. Magruder said to me that Mr. Parkinson wanted me to write a statement um, just on regular yellow legal pad. Let, no, let me ask you this. Maybe I can short circuit a little bit. Did you tell either of these men before you went to the grand jury in August of 72 that you were going to tell a false story? No, sir, I did not. All right. Let me ask you one other line of questions, and then I will uh, pass it on to the chairman. Your testimony at trial, of course, dovetail almost completely with what Mr. Liddy testified to at trial as was planned. Is that correct? I'm sorry, sir. It dovetails. Mr. Liddy did not testify at the trial. I don't mean uh, Mr. Liddy, Mr. Magruder. As far as $100,000 was concerned. Uh, I have never seen Mr. Magruder's testimony at the trial. Never read it and do not know what that testimony is. I read you a question from the trial transcript. Is this uh, my testimony? No, this is Mr. Magruder's yes, uh, testimony. The question, what funding or financial arrangements did you agree upon with Mr. Liddy with respect to the two different assignments that you just described? Answer, on the first assignment, we agreed to a funding of approximately $100,000 $100, for the 10-month period starting in January and on the convention program, we, we agreed to $150,000 or so, a total funding of $250,000. With regard to the $100,000, he was talking about the sur surrogate candidate program or protection for the surrogate candidates. Yes, sir. So I assume he was. assuming that is a fact, then that would dovetail with, with essentially with what you testified yes, to. Yes, sir, that's correct. Is that correct? All right. Did you, did the, how many times did you discuss this matter with the, uh, Mr. Silver, Mr. Glanzer, Mr. Campbell? Uh, I made one grand jury appearance in August of 1972 and discussed it with them then. Um, and there was a pretrial meeting, I believe, the night before or two nights before, I'm not sure which, before the trial that was uh, brief in Mr. Silbert's office. How, how long did it last? Uh, I think when well, Mr. Magruder was there for an early part of it and then he left. Were you both in the same room? Uh, uh, we were both in the same room for a, a brief period of time, yes sir. Was uh, Mr. Sloan there at the same no, sir, time? No he was not. Who else was in the room? 
while you uh, and Mr. I believe Mr. Magruder, Mr. Magruder, Magruder, Mr. Silbert, Mr. Glanzer, I think Mr. Campbell was there. I'm not sure. All right. Then Mr. Magruder left? Yes, sir, he did. All right. Did any of the prosecutors ever ask you if Magruder had tried to get you to perjure yourself? No, sir. I have no further questions. You, uh, you talked to Magruder before you went for the grand jury in August 1972. Yes, sir. And uh, you agreed to tell, to testify that during uh, December 1970, uh, uh, 1971, you had told Magruder that it would require about uh, $100,000 for the Dirty Tricks uh, episode. No, sir. For what episode? No, sir. What? What I testify that you had estimated. Yes, sir. That's correct, but not for dirty tricks. For for uh, information gathering from radical groups. From radical groups. Yes, sir. Now, uh, Mr. Magruder had tried, had attempted to get you to swear some other things, which you say were not true. Yes, sir. And you refused to do that. Yes, sir. Then you went before the grand jury and you testified in August 1972, and that's the only time you've been before the grand jury. Yes, sir. Then in uh, about. Uh, Last of March, Mr. McCord wrote a letter to Judge Sirica, which came out in the newspapers. Yes, sir. And about that, was about that time that Mr. Magruder called you? Shortly after and, that. And told you things were getting hot? No, sir, that was on April 9th. April 9th. Yes. Well, he, the, For himself, he said. Yes. You came down uh, to Washington um, after you received the phone call from Mr. Magruder? Well, I had already, I was already planning to come down yes. uh, to Washington. Well, now, uh, when did you come? Uh, on the evening of April, of April 12th. And uh, was that the time that uh, Magruder suggested to you that you go and talk to the counsel for the committee, that is, uh, uh, Kenneth uh, Parkinson? And, no, uh, no, sir. Uh, Mr. Chairman, that... Uh, well, when was that? Yes, sir. I'm, I'm, I believe Mr. McCord's letter to Judge Sirica became was made public in a story in the Washington Post on a Saturday morning towards the end of March, the 20-something, 20 24th, 25th, I think, something like that. Well, anyway, you talked to Parkinson and O'Brien on the 28th of March. Yes, sir, I did. And you did that at the instance of Mr. Magruder? Uh, I've talked to Mr. O'Brien on my own. I, did, I talked to Mr. Parkinson because... Mr. Magruder had called me saying, Mr. Parkinson wants to see you and is going to call you to set up an appointment. Well, did you have a, t you talked with Parkinson and O'Brien together, did you? No, sir, not together, separately. But at the same, on the at same afternoon. The same afternoon? Yes, sir. And which one, you, you say you told them that, uh, who was it told you uh, that the whole course of history was going to be changed? That was, uh, that was on Friday afternoon, April 13th. And that was Mr. Sharp, Mr. Magruder's, yes. one of Mr. Magruder's. Well, I'll go letter. back then to, to Parkinson and O'Brien. Yes, sir. You told them, in effect, that you were troubled because of uh, your having testified before the grand jury that uh, you had uh, estimated for, for Mr. Magruder in December 1971 that uh, it would require about $100,000 to... Uh, Yes, to uh, supervise uh, these uh, 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 off-color, well, uh, radical groups. Yes, sir. And uh, uh, what, uh, what, what did Mr. Parkinson say when you talked to him about that? Uh, I mean, when Mr. Parkinson learned that that was a was not a true statement. Yes. Um, I don't remember that he said anything other than he was taking some notes, I believe, and uh, and I I probably initiated the the question by saying, well, you know, what, uh, Ken, what do you think? Uh, to which he responded, Bart, he said, uh, yeah, he said, I don't think you have a problem at all. He said, that's, uh, he said, all you've done is just embellish a little. Yeah, that's Miss Parkinson. Yes, sir. Well, what did Mr. Brown say about it? Uh, Mr. O'Brien said, uh, I don't think you have a problem. I he did not use uh, any other words. In other words, that's you, you, both of the attorneys for the committee told you after you told them that you had sworn uh, uh, falsely yes, and uh, before the grand jury, they said there's no problem. Uh, you, that's you just embellished things a little. Uh, Mr. Mr. Parkinson used yes. those words, yes, sir. Now, um, then uh, 
short time left that you went to see Mr. Sharp, who was then the attorney of Mr. Magruder. Yes, sir. And Mr. Sharp told you that the, that the whole course of history is going to be changed. Yes, sir. Did he explain what he meant by that? No, no sir, he didn't. But uh, he, he recommended that you talk to Mr. Magruder? No, sir, he did not. He, 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 said that, uh, he said that it would be wise for me to, to retain an attorney, and that I should tell the attorney, uh, my attorney, the same brief story that I had told him, and to have my attorney call him. And that's when I, then he asked me if I knew any, and I asked him that, well, since his client was the one who had, in effect, gotten, uh, asked me to do that, that it would be helpful if he... Well, now, did Mr. Sharp tell you that uh, they could arrange for you to see the, the, the uh, yes, sir. district attorney before he Mr. Said, Magruder? Yes, sir. He stated specifically, if we decide that Jeb should go down and see Silbert, we would certainly give you the courtesy of going first. Those and then, were his exact then words. you found out, went out and you met Mr. Magruder and found out from him he'd already been to see Silbert. Yes, sir. Now, uh, did you consult a lawyer or friend of yours after you were asked by Magruder to, to uh, lie? Uh, yes, sir, I did. And uh, did he tell you that? Uh, you asked him what uh, he would do under the circumstances. He said he would probably lie for the president. The, those, those words were not used, Mr. Chairman. Well, what were you? Um, I stated to, uh, I went to, uh, right after Mr. Magruder had, had had this discussion with me in late June, uh, I went to a friend of mine uh, who happens to be a lawyer, but I didn't go to him because he was a lawyer. And... Uh, and uh, to share an experience, uh, I think. And I, I stated what Mr. Magruder had said to me. We talked about it. Uh, I think you've got to project yourself back a little bit in a period of time. We were, uh, this, was, uh, this was in the heat of battle uh, in a campaign. We were, uh, here were two loyalists uh, talking be between each other about uh, the prospect of having uh, uh, the Democrats, our quote, enemy, uh, come into our camp and, and bust our, our, our whole campaign wide open. Uh, and I wasn't, so, I wasn't concerned about, about uh, bad things. I was concerned about things like polling and state strategy and research and advertising and all these other things that could be made public. So I, I told him my, uh, what Mr. Magruder had asked me to do. Uh, he made a comment to me. He said, after thinking about it, he said, what and by the way, I think another important thing, and if I may digress just momentarily, Mr. Chairman, I think it's very important that both of us, me particularly, since I'm the one involved, believed Mr. Magruder had no reason to mistrust him at all, that, that neither he nor anybody else was involved in the Watergate. And, and he specifically said that it was important that, that the investigation be confined to the Watergate and and I didn't think that I was being asked to do anything in connection with the Watergate break-in at all. Um, uh, my friend said to me, what, I, I, he said, I, I think he was speaking rather rhetorically, what difference does it make whether the money was authorized for this purpose or this purpose if what they're apparently saying is that Liddy diverted funds and, and went off and did something illegal? If one thing is going to embarrass the president and the other one isn't, he said, uh, I wouldn't do it for Mitchell and I wouldn't do it for Haldeman, but I'd do it for the boss. And uh, that's the feeling I had at that was time. Was that before you testified for the grand jury? Yes, sir. Who was the lawyer who gave you, told you that? Mr. Chairman, I, I would respectfully request that I, I not have to give his name at this time. My, my lawyer knows who it is. He's not involved in this in any way. Uh, uh, well, did, you, insist well, on did, it, you, did you go before the grand jury and make a statement on account of what the lawyer said to you or well, on account of what uh, Mr. Magruder had said to you? Uh, th this lawyer was also a member of the Committee for the Re-election of the President, so he was, uh, but not acting in a legal capacity. Well, so, um, so he, he is not a, a... He was a member of the Committee to Re-elect the President. Yes, sir. I, I think under these circumstances you ought to divulge that. All right, sir. His name is Curtis Herge. Curtis who? Herge, H-E-R-G-E. Yes.
Now, did Mr. Magruder, at the time of your conversations with him about April, tell you that uh, he that he uh, had prior knowledge of the Watergate matter? I'm sorry, sir. Did Mr. Magruder admit to you at the time of your conversation about April of this year that he, Mr. Porter, did, did have prior knowledge of the Watergate affair? Uh, on April 14th, in the afternoon of April 14th, was the, was the first time that I learned that Mr. Magruder had prior knowledge or that anybody else had prior knowledge other than those that had been convicted. Now, how did you learn that? Uh, I deduced it from his statement that there were going to be a number of indictments, and he included his own name. Up to that time, he had always maintained to you that he had no prior knowledge. Yes, sir, absolutely. And at that time, he stated to you that uh, they were, that probably some people would go to jail yes, on sir. account of the Watergate affair, and uh, he, he, did he predict that he himself would be one of them to go to jail in all probability? Yes, sir. Did he say he had, uh, had talked to Mitchell about the matter, in addition to talking to Ergman? Yes, sir, I think he did. And he told you that uh, Mitchell was going to go, uh, had told him he was going to deny complicity to the end? Yes, sir. Order. I'm not going to try to take you over the same testimony that counsel and the chairman have already covered, nor am I going to be unduly critical of your position, I trust. Rather than inquire into the factual background and the factors and circumstances that led you to swear falsely, apparently, before the grand jury of the United States District Court, rather than elaborate and expand further the situation that leads you to this witness chair today, I'd like to probe your reasons and motivations. I'd like to start with how you got into the dirty tricks business, what you thought of it at the time, and what you thought you would accomplish. And I believe that's a good place to stop. Would you tell me that, please? Um, the first time I ever heard the word uh, dirty tricks, I think, uh, was from Mr. Magruder sometime in the fall of 1971, and uh, I had to ask him what it was. He asked me if I knew who Dick Tuck was, and I said, no, I'd never heard the name, and he described some of Mr. Tuck's activities. Um, I then at, uh, upon reflection, remembered uh, something out of uh, Theodore White's book from the 1964 presidential campaign, um, where President Johnson had a group called the Five O'Clock Club, I think it was, a group of uh, 12 uh, young attorneys and White House staffers that met in the White House every afternoon during the campaign to plan uh, all kinds of deviltry, I think it was referred to, uh, and uh, dirty tricks against Senator Goldwater. Now, let me stop you just and a I, moment. And this is what I thought dirty tricks were. All right, may I stop you just a moment? Yes, sir. The chairman has explained to you and to the committee that we intend to recall you for further testimony. Yes, sir. And that the scope of our inquiry today ought to be on the Watergate and attendant circumstances. Yes, sir. I'm departing from that slightly, but I want to tell you that I'm searching for your motivations and reasons. I am not now, at this time, searching for the facts. I, I will at a different time, but any insight you can give me as to why a young man with your background, with your education, with your obvious intelligence, 
found yourself in charge of or deeply involved in a dirty tricks operation of the campaign. I need to know more of why. Yes, sir. I don't, I, I don't think I was in, in, in charge of any dirty tricks operation at the campaign. I'm not aware anybody has testified to that fact. Well, tell me what your involvement was. Um, I dispensed uh, certain monies uh, to, to certain individuals at Mr. Magruder's request uh, of the, over the period of time uh, from probably October of 71 until probably May or June, I guess, of 1972, uh, some $69,000. Uh, about $52,000 of that $69,000 was given to people or persons the use of which, uh, for purposes the use of which I did not know at the time. Um, so approximately 75% of that money was used for, for purposes I did not know about. Um, I did, I was asked to, to uh, have a dick, quote, dick tup Tuck type of individual, find one, and and uh, and pay him to uh, to um, perform those kinds of activities that uh, that were more in the prank category. Um, the first person that I made contact with uh, did that for about two weeks, as I remember, and then uh, uh, decided that that was not his bag. The second person was on, uh, was paid for a period of about three months and participated in some of the primary campaigns. Um, that was just about the extent of it. Well, who else was doing this? I do not know, sir. Well, do you know of anyone else besides you who were hiring people for pranks? No, sir, I do not. Then, as I understand the essence of your testimony at this point, then 75 percent of the money is unaccountable, or you cannot account for 25 percent of the money you can, that you hired two men to do a, as you put it, dick-tuck operation, uh, a so-called prank operation. Yes, is this uh, uh, synonymous with the, quote, dirty tricks operation that you referred to earlier in your testimony? Uh, no, sir. Mis no, sir. Mr. Magruder indicated to me that money had been, in fact, authorized to Mr. Liddy for dirty tricks and other special projects. Now, what he said was that they were not illegal, and that what Mr. Liddy had done, apparently, or what he had apparently done at that time, was illegal and was not a part of that, of that authorization. Did you ever have any doubt in your mind about the propriety of this? About the what, sir? The propriety. Not the illegality, but the propriety of it. Well, I didn't know what he was referring to, and I never, he didn't tell me what he was referring to. He never explained any of the dirty tricks operations that Mr. Liddy was involved in. And I don't think that answers my question, and I'm, I'm going sorry. to put it again. Did you ever have any qualms about the propriety of what you were doing in hiring these people for pranks or dirty tricks or whatever it was? I'm probing into your state of I mind, understand. Mr. Porter. I understand, sir. Um, I think the thought crossed my mind, Senator, that, uh, in all honesty, uh, that I really couldn't see what effect it had on re-electing the President of the United States. On the other hand, in all fairness, I don't, uh, I didn't, wasn't the one to stand up in, the, in a meeting and, and, and say that this should be stopped either. Now, now let's, let's So I, I don't, I mean, there's some place in between. I was, uh, You've I kind reached, of drifted along with the... You've with the reached now precisely that point that I'd like to examine, and I okay. intend to examine with other witnesses as this hearing proceeds. Where does the system break down when concern for what's right, as distinguished from what is legal, is never asserted or never thought about, and you don't stand up and say so? I At any time, did you ever think of saying, I don't think this is quite right, this isn't quite the way it ought to be? Did you Surely ever think I of that? I think, I think probably most people probably would, would stop and think that at some point. Did you? Time. Yes, sir, I did. What did you do about it? I didn't do anything Why about didn't it. you? I, in all honesty, probably because of the fear of, uh, of uh, group pressure that, uh, that would ensue of, uh, 
of not being a team player. And the fear of not being a team player was strong enough to suppress your judgment on what action you should take if you considered an action uh, improper, if not illegal. Well, I never considered any action up to that point illegal, number one. However, do you think that an organization, was, was, a political organization, should be so anonymous, so military and obedient, so careful for the concerns of peer approval, that it each and every member of that organization, at least up to a certain point and level in the organizational chart, completely abdicates his conscience and judgment? No, sir, I certainly do not. What caused you to, do, to abdicate your own conscience and uh, disapproval, if you did disapprove, of the pranks or dirty tricks operation? Well, uh, Senator Baker, my my loyalty to this to this man, Richard Nixon, goes back longer than any person that you will see sitting at this table throughout any of these hearings. I first met the I, president. I really very much doubt that, Mr. Ford. No, Porter. sir. My, I, I've, no, I've known Richard Nixon probably longer than you've been alive. And I really suspect that the greatest disservice that a man could do to a president of the United States yes, would be to abdicate his conscience. Well, I understand, Senator. I, I first met Mr. Nixon, when I was eight years old in 1946, when he ran for Congress in my home district, and I wore Nixon buttons when I was eight, and when I was 10, and when I was 12, and when I was 16. And I, my family worked for him, my father worked for him in campaigns, my mother worked for him in campaigns. I, I, I felt as if I had known this man all my life, uh, not personally, perhaps, but in, 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 a, in a spirit. I felt a deep sense of loyalty to him. Mr. Porter, and I, I'm sorry, I was appealed to I'm, on I'm that sorry to interrupt you at this point, but we have the warning bell on the roll call. I know you'll return, and when we do, we'll continue this, if we I understand. Yes, sir. In the middle of Senator Baker's attempts to get at the motivation of Herbert Porter, the committee is taking another break to vote on an amendment to a pending farm bill. Porter seems to be saying that Senator Baker is overemphasizing the importance of his role in the whole affair. Well, we shall see. Public television's complete coverage of the hearings continues after station identification. Unabridged coverage of these hearings is provided as a public service by the member stations of PBS, the Public Broadcasting Service.
in all honesty, that I really couldn't see what effect it had on re-electing the President of the United States. On the other hand, in all fairness, I don't, uh, I didn't, wasn't the one to stand up in, the, in a meeting and, and, and say that this should be stopped either. Now, now let's, let's So I, I don't, I mean, there's some place in between. I was, uh, you kind reached, of drifted along with the... You've with reached the, now precisely that point that I'd like to examine, and I okay. intend to examine with other witnesses as this hearing proceeds. Where does the system break down when concern for what's right as distinguished from what is legal, is never asserted or never thought about, and you don't stand up and say so. I At think any time, did you ever think of saying, I don't think this is quite right, this isn't quite the way it ought to be? Did you Surely ever think I did. of that? I think, I think probably most people probably would, would stop and think that at some point. Did you? But yes, sir, I did. What did you do about it? I didn't do anything. Why about it. didn't you? Uh, in all honesty, probably because of the fear of, uh, of uh, group pressure that, uh, that would ensue of, uh, of not being a team player. And the fear of not being a team player was strong enough to suppress your judgment on what action you should take if you considered an action uh, improper, if not illegal. Well, I never considered any action up to that point illegal, number one. However, do you think that an organization, was, was, a political organization, should be so anonymous, so military and obedient, so careful for the concerns of peer approval, that it, each and every member of that organization, at least up to a certain point and level in the organizational chart, completely abdicates his conscience and judgment? No, sir, I certainly do not. What caused you to, do, to abdicate your own conscience and uh, disapproval, if you did disapprove, of the pranks or dirty tricks operation? Well, uh, Senator Baker, my my loyalty to this to this man, Richard Nixon, goes back longer than any person that you will see sitting at this table throughout any of these hearings. I first met the I, president. I really very much doubt that, Mr. No, Porter. sir. My, I, I've, no, I've known Richard Nixon probably longer than you've been alive. And I really suspect that the greatest disservice that a man could do to a president of the United States yes, would be to abdicate his conscience. Well, I understand, Senator. I, I first met Mr. Nixon when I was eight years old in 1946 when he ran for Congress in my home district and I wore Nixon buttons when I was eight and when I was ten and when I was twelve and when I was sixteen and I, my family worked for him, my father worked for him in campaigns, my mother worked for him in campaigns. I, I, I felt as if I had known this man all my life, uh, not personally perhaps but in, 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 a, in a spirit. I felt a deep sense of loyalty to him. Mr. Porter, I'm, I'm sorry, I was appealed I'm, to, I'm on that sorry to interrupt you at this point, but we have the warning bell on the roll call. I know you'll return, and when we do, we'll continue this, if we I understand. Yes, sir. In the middle of Senator Baker's attempts to get at the motivation of Herbert Porter, the committee is taking another break to vote on an amendment to a pending farm bill. Porter seems to be saying that Senator Baker is overemphasizing the importance of his role in the whole affair. Well, we shall see. Public television's complete coverage of the hearings continues after station identification. Unabridged coverage of these hearings is provided as a public service by the member stations of PBS, the Public Broadcasting Service.
From Washington, NPACT continues its coverage of hearings by the Senate Select Committee on Presidential Campaign Activities. Here again, correspondent Jim Lehrer. Senator Baker, the ranking minority member of the committee, now resumes his questioning of Herbert Porter. Now, Baker says he will concentrate on motivation for the time being, but we'll have a lot of other questions to ask the former campaign scheduling director in the future. I might say that the chairman will be here shortly. I understand from the chairman's representative that it, it was his wish that we reopen the hearings and continue. Mr. Porter, I reiterate what I said earlier. I am in no way trying to be antagonistic to you. I have no animosity towards you. I'm trying to probe for a state of mind and the institutional arrangements, the structuring, the situation that produced what would appear to me to be an abdication of one's personal judgment of what is right or wrong about a particular set of activities. That inquiry was frankly kicked off in my mind by the designation of, quote, dirty tricks within the campaign organization itself by a situation that led you, by your testimony apparently, to commit perjury. Now, with that as the end result, I hope you can understand why I'm trying to probe for the set of circumstances that led a young man to do those things. I think I've spent most of my questions. I think that I'm at best in an area of questionable uh, definition. But if you have anything further you can give me that would shed light on why you agreed to swear falsely, why you closed your mind, apparently, to uh, undesirable conduct, if not uh, improper conduct, in a political campaign, the committee would be grateful for it. Senator Baker, I am not a, a philosopher or a, a moral philosopher, but I, I am trying to answer your questions as honestly as I possibly can, and, and hopefully it comes out right or if it doesn't, but it's, it's as honest as I can make it. First of all, I, I was not in charge of dirty tricks. I, I don't know where all this money went. I did, was never aware of all this money. I was aware of the, of, the, of the amount of money that I got from Mr. Sloan, and I, even that I was really only aware of, of about $17,000 where that actually ended up. Uh, I had been told... Uh, did you tell Mr. Sloan what you used that money for? No, sir, I did not. Did Mr. Sloan ever ask you about it? I've heard Mr. Sloan make that statement, and I, I believe I would not dispute it. I'm sure he probably did, and I probably said you'll have to ask Mr. Magruder whether that was because I didn't know what it was being used for or whether I was just evading a question. I don't remember the conversation Mr. at all. If Mr. Sloan were to assert that he asked you what the money was being used for and you refused to tell him, would you dispute that? I would not dispute it. I, I, just, I don't remember the conversation, Senator. All right, sir. Taking place. But I, I, I do not, did not have any knowledge of that, Senator. I did not know. At, at the time, Mr. Magruder talked to me. Uh, in retrospect, I was a pretty easy target for that sort of thing because I didn't know anything. I didn't have any knowledge of the, the, of the Strawn money, the Kalmbach money, the Liddy money, all these other things. I didn't know anything about that. Did you ever see any stolen documents or transcription of illegal wiretaps? I never, I didn't, never saw any transcription of legal wiretaps. Did you ever see any stolen documents? <sighs> Probably so. Probably so. But I don't know whether they were stolen or whether they were sent by somebody perhaps in a campaign. Do you know Mrs. Duncan? I know Martha Duncan, yes. Who was she? She was my secretary for a short period of time. Did she ever type up any documents that yes, you knew did. to be stolen documents? Um, yes, sir. What happened then? Why? Tell me a little, illuminate that a little bit. Why? What, what, friend, what tinge of conscience came into play when you instructed your secretary to type a copy of stolen documents? Uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure of any tinge of conscience, uh, Senator. Uh, I had been told by others in the campaign that this kind of thing was a normal activity in a campaign. I, in, my, in my opening statement, I said that I had never been involved in a political cam before, campaign before, and I had not. These things were all new to me, and I accepted them for what they were. You know, that's a terrible indictment of politics. And uh, being I, a politician, I'm, I'm really distressed to hear that. Are you telling me, in effect, that 
It was your opinion that this sort of thing went on in politics yes, with Democrats and Republicans, and it was fair game, and it might bother your conscience a little, but it had to be done. Is that what you're telling me? That's exactly what I felt, Senator. How do you feel now? <laughs> well, I'm not sure that they've stopped. What would you do now? If what? Well, if you were in the same situation, pick any one of the things, whether you're swearing falsely to the grand jury or whether you're photographing or rather typing stolen documents, whatever it is, or $17,000 for yes, pranks or dirty tricks, what would, what would your attitude be at this point? It would be that I would not become involved in any way, shape, or form. What has brought about the change? Where, where is this reemergence of a human instinct for, for decency? Well, again, you're asking me to, to, to give a, a moral judgment. I, I, I don't know. I, I, in my own personal case, it has devastated me personally, and that's reason enough for me never to do it again. I, I can't answer for the others. If you make a contribution to this country by serving as an example, a deterrent to others having that attitude, it might make some atonement for that uh, submerged conscience, but time will tell that. We'll have Sir, to wait and see. I had that in my statement and took it out because I thought that was rather self-serving to make, but that's how I feel. Can you, and before I ask this last question, let me point out that this inquiry is not that of an amateur philosopher or psychologist, but rather in pursuit of the statutory jurisdiction of this committee, which is not only to find those things which may have been illegal, but improper uh, as well. I understand. Now, can you tell me, Mr. Porter, how we might ventilate the structure of campaigning? how we might expose to the fresh breeze of conscience and personality the organization of a presidential campaign so that young men and old men assert their sense of right or wrong instead of doing so and so because someone told them to. I think you're doing a damn fine job right now, Senator. <laughs> well, it's a painful thing, you know. Yes, sir. And it's a terrible way to have to do it. Do you have any other suggestion? I have often thought we had too much money. Money is the... I'm sure the chairman will approve of this. <laughs> And in deference to the chairman, I'll save it for him. To leave his <laughs> I'm waiting myself to find out which one he's going to apply to my case. <laughs> Mr. Porter, I believe that's all I have. I'd like to uh, yield to Senator Noy, if I may. Yes, sir. Thank you very much. Mr. Porter, you have, uh, in your interview with the staff, said that it was a standard operating procedure that Mr. Haldeman of the White House be kept totally informed of everything that went on. Is that correct? Uh, Senator, in no way, I, I believe I told the staff it was my understanding that, uh, certainly in my area, that uh, major policy decisions and that sort of thing, uh, that Mr. Haldeman's uh, aide, Mr. Strawn, always got copies of everything that we did, everything that went on in my division, and I'm sure got copies of everything that went on in other divisions. To the smallest details such as guest lists? Uh, yes, sir, I think uh, that's Did true. you advise Mr. Haldeman as to your cash disbursements? Uh, no, sir, I don't think I Are did. Are they a bit more important than guest lists? I'm not sure I understand the question, oh, okay. uh, Senator Noe. No, you, you just indicated that Mr. Haldeman was uh, desirous of getting everything, including guest lists at parties. Now, and I asked you if you had advised Mr. Haldeman of your cash disbursements, $67,000 worth, and you said no. I'm and I'm just wondering, don't you think $67,000 is a bit more important than just a little old guest list? I think the two, uh, one doesn't follow the other. The, the, uh, 
the, the money that was dispersed uh, through me as a conduit, uh, Mr. Magruder was aware of, and it would have been Mr. Magruder's uh, responsibility to relay that uh, that situation to his his superior, Mr. Mitchell, and if he wanted to uh, to uh, to Mr. Kalmbach, or I'm sorry, not Mr. Kalmbach, Mr. Strawn or Mr. Haldeman, that was not my function, no, sir. I presume you kept uh, a record of all your disbursements. I did. What happened to the record, sir? At the end of March, uh, 1972. I received a phone call from Mr. Sloan saying that he would like to balance out because April 7th was approaching. Uh, I, to protect myself internally, called upon Mr. Reasoner, who has testified before this committee, to come in and act as a disinterested third party to review what I had uh, in, I had it on a little secretarial uh, steno pad. Uh, an in and out uh, sheet, if you will, a record of my um, uh, copies of my receipts and um, and cash on hand. Uh, Mr. Reasoner did that. Uh, I called Mr. Sloan. I told him the figure fifty two thousand dollars that I had received from him from the whatever the beginning of time was until that point. He agreed to that. Um, and I did not have an accounting function at the committee. No, in fact, nobody at the committee for the re-election of, of the president had any accounting uh, or dispersing function, so to speak. That was the finance committee. And I had no need for the records, and I threw them away. Was that I had, I had, excuse me, sir. Was that the only reason for destroying the records? Were you afraid the information might be incriminating? No, sir. In fact, uh, just the opposite. Uh, Mr. I made sure Mr. Reasoner had seen it all. I, I, I just physically, I had no reason to keep them. I had balanced with Mr. Sloan. He was satisfied. I was satisfied that uh, that I had that there would be no questions regarding the money. I had asked Mr. Reasoner to be, act as an independent auditor. He did. Um, I started fresh. Um, and and and. Through the deck, through the little slips of paper away. Uh, Mr. Porter, after the Watergate trial, uh, you sought a good government job, didn't you? Uh, yes, sir, I did. And when Mr. Malik of the White House uh, was not helpful, you went to Mr. Larue and told him, "Quote: Listen, Fred, you know what I did at the trial. I have been loyal." I don't expect to be treated better than anyone else, but I, I do expect to be treated worse. And Mr. LaRue said, I know I'll contact John. That's correct, sir. Did this happen? Uh, I think basically, yes. Who is John? I would presume that's John Mitchell. After that, did uh, Mr. Magruder tell you that Mr. Haldeman had called Mr. Malik to ensure that you would be taken care of? Uh, Mr. Magruder told me that he had, he had talked to Mr. Haldeman and that Mr. Haldeman had called Mr. Malik uh, and had told him, in, in effect, to kind of back off Porter, I think was the Do you know for a fact that Mr. Haldeman was aware of the situation? No, sir, I do not. I'm, I only state what Mr. Magruder told me. Did you get a good government job after that? Uh, not, through, uh, not through that uh, particular process, no, sir. I, on my own, contacted uh, one of the department secretaries uh, whom I knew personally, uh, made arrangements to talk to him, and through a series of interviews um, was offered a position in the government at the end of March. Um, at the same time, as early as the latter part of January, had been seeking uh, employment in private industry um, to have a, a choice between the two when I uh, when the time came for me to make a choice. Wasn't that job subject to clearance by Mr. Malik? I do not know, sir. Now, you advise the committee that you are in California on June the 17th in the company of Mr. Mitchell and who else? Uh, Mr. Mitchell, Mr. LaRue, Mr. Mardian, Mr. Magruder, uh, Mr. Raymond Caldero, who was uh, in charge of our celebrities at that time. And at that and time, I, you received a call from Washington, or someone did. Who received the call? Uh, that was in the morning. Uh, this was at the Beverly Hills Hotel. Uh, 
Mr. Caldero and I had come down from our rooms at 8.30 to uh, have breakfast. We sat down at a table next to Mr. and Mrs. LaRue, Mr. and Mrs. Mardian, and Mr. and Mrs. Magruder. Is I'm this not... when you first learned about the Watergate break-in? Well, in looking backwards, Senator, I guess you would have to say so, but at the time, no. Uh, the phone call that you're referring to is one that Mr. Magruder had received already, I think, because he came back to the table, and not to me, but to the people he was sitting with, said, do you know where I can find a secure phone? And there was a discussion at the table, apparently, about where one might find a secure phone. And he turned to me and he said, do you know where I can find a secure phone? I said, uh, I said, what for? And he said, well, Liddy's trying to call me, or wants to talk to me, and wants to talk to me on a secure line. And I said, well, we do have a, a, an, a direct outside line in the Mitchell suite. Why don't you use that? And he said, no, that's not good enough. I said, well, why don't you just go out to a pay phone and call him back? I mean, nobody's going to, you know, that's about as secure as you're going to get. That was the, the end of that conversation. Who took charge of the situation? I beg your pardon, sir? Who took charge of the situation there? You I'm not sure point. I understand the question. When this call was made, weren't the others agitated? Or weren't they I, aware? I don't remember. Uh, Senator, it meant so little to me at the time. I don't remember. Uh, I think my back was to them, and I don't remember seeing any expressions or conversation. Uh, Mr. Magruder appeared quite open about it at the time. Uh, I mean, in a, in a were loud you aware, voice. Were you aware of a telephone call that Mr. Magruder made on June the 18th from California at 4 a.m. in the morning? Um, you would have to qualify that, Senator. I'm, I'm, I understand that Mr. Magruder made or had phone conversations early Sunday morning. Uh, um, who, who was with, the party contacted in Key Biscayne? I do, I do not know, sir. I only know that uh, I think, uh, in fact, I think Mrs. Porter, who's sitting behind me, uh, told me that Mrs. Magruder had told her we were all kind of sitting or living in a, in a, a suite of rooms on the same floor that her husband had been on the phone all morning with Key Biscayne, I think was the, was the quote. Uh, that's the only place I can remember where that statement might come from. You advised the committee that Mr. Magruder told you that he purged himself 12 times. Did he tell you about the 12 times? No, sir, he did not. He made, the comment, that, he made that comment the afternoon, the same afternoon on April 14th. I'm just, as a matter of curiosity, you have indicated that uh, you were moved to take certain actions because of fear of ostracization. You didn't want to be ostracized by the team. I'm not. I think that's the phrase you use. What team are you talking about? I just, it, it, this is the generic term, Senator, not uh, any particular squad of people. Uh, it, it, I use the term generically, I think. People like Mr. Haldeman? Probably. Mr. Mitchell? Probably. The President? I don't think that ever crossed my mind, no, sir. I have other questions, but they relate to uh, the dirty tricks, and I've been advised we take these up later on, so, Mr. Chairman, I yield at this time. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. If there's no objection, we have some more, more votes coming up very quickly. In fact, I see your five minutes is up. You've got to get away in five minutes. Uh, if there's no objection, we'll reach you. you can come back Tuesday. Sir, I'm going to California in the morning with, my, with Mrs. Porter. It will require me to fly back on Monday. If that's what the committee wants me to do, I'm certainly willing to do it. Yeah. Well, I think it would be uh, well. For, I don't believe we can finish this afternoon. I hate the inconvenience. No inconvenience. So we'll stand in recess till uh, Tuesday at 10 o'clock. And that's how the third week of the Watergate hearings ended. 
We have now heard from 14 witnesses about the Watergate break-in, the subsequent cover-up, including requested perjury, and the way the campaign finance system worked. But big questions remain, obviously, about just how far into the White House the trail of Watergate leads. David Austin, a former member of the U.S. Attorney's Office here who now practices wa uh, law in Washington and teaches at Georgetown University, watched the hearings with us today. And we'd like to ask Mr. Austin what, from a lawyer's evaluation, uh, what the hearings produced today or thus far. Well, Jim, from a, a lawyer's point of view, I think the testimony of Porter was by far the most interesting. He, of course, testified that he lied. He lied twice, once before a grand jury and once at trial, and that is two separate crimes. I would think that he would be a fairly easy witness, at least by some standards, to cross-examine. Uh, I contrast him to Sloan. But Porter has an amazing memory, or so it would appear. He remembers the exact words that took place in conversations, some of which he had with people months or, in one case, even a year ago, whereas Sloan cannot remember the exact words. Uh, Sloan remembers the conversations to the best of his ability, so to speak. Uh, when it comes time to question Mr. Porter, I think that uh, the defense attorneys who cross-examine him will have the transcripts of uh, today's testimony, and they will be able to cross-examine him word by word. Incidentally, uh, Porter, I don't think, comes across quite as well as Sloan, who, when he testified, just exuded candor and honesty, because, as you will recall, uh, Porter testified that he came forward and told his story because Mr. Magruder was about to put him in a position where he, Mr. Porter, had to talk. Uh, Jeb Magruder said, uh, you'd better tell all, and that is why Porter came forward. Whereas Sloan, there came a point in Mr. Sloan's life where he simply could not take one more act, and he simply quit. And I think that kind of candor is going to influence a jury uh, far more than Mr. Porter's. And finally, and I uh, am particularly sensitive to this, of course, I'm afraid the uh, legal profession has again taken it on the chin. There was testimony. Some of it, of course, was unsubstantiated. But there was nonetheless testimony that uh, attorneys have not acted properly, or so it would appear, and indeed testimony that one attorney went to sleep uh, while talking to a man who at least was ostensibly a client at the time. And lastly, uh, it would appear that uh, the legal profession is on trial in the Watergate case, and I'm afraid that um, we, have, we have heard at least, and the appearance is almost as important as the actuality, we have heard that some attorneys have simply not conducted themselves as they should. Everything seems to be on trial in Watergate. Uh, the ba the, our basic governmental system, the presidency, uh, uh, campaigning, uh, now the legal profession. Robin? Uh, Mr. Austin, presumably Mr. Porter could still be indicted on these counts of perjury. Would, in the eyes of the law, there be a mitigating circumstance in the fact that he has now come forward, cooperated, and told all? Apparently? Well, Mr. Porter can certainly uh, be indicted. Let me say, first of all, that whether he be indicted is strictly up to the prosecutor. And the law in this country is fairly clear on that subject. You cannot force a prosecutor to present any case to a grand jury. And if the prosecutors feel that because Mr. Porter has, in fact, come forward and has, uh, at least to a certain degree, voluntarily testified, uh, there is no way that the uh, prosecutors can be forced to indict him. Let me say, however, that if he is indicted and he either pleads guilty or is found guilty, the appropriate sentence will be up to the judge, and then I would guess the question of strict mitigation would be uh, up to the judge who passes sentence on him. Mr. Austin, thank you. But the Watergate probe includes more than what is happening in the Senate caucus room. Today, H.R. Haldeman's deposition in the Democrat civil suit was released. In it, Haldeman recalled that John Dean, the White House counsel at the time of the Watergate, was never asked formally to investigate the incident. That raised questions about the president's statement of last August that Dean had looked into the situation and reported that no one then working at the White House was involved. It now appears that Dean never reported anything about the situation directly to Mr. Nixon until this year. And the president today nominated Kansas City Police Chief Clarence Kelly to be permanent director of the FBI. An earlier choice, L. Patrick Gray, is of course another casualty of the Watergate. William Ruckelshaus will continue to head the bureau until Kelly is confirmed. So that's the current White House reaction to the Watergate. 
In an effort to see how satisfied the Irvin Committee is with its work so far, NPAC correspondent Peter Kay talked with Senator Daniel Inoue of Hawaii. Senator, we're three weeks into the we're three weeks into the hearings with I don't know how many weeks to go. What's been your impression up to this point? Well, it's been exhausting from a personal standpoint. Uh, I think the committee has done its best to be uh, as objective and bipartisan or nonpartisan as possible. Uh, we have tried our very best to get out the facts as much as possible. Uh, However, we are always aware that uh, there's always a dangerous possibility that we may, in the process of these hearings, uh, be uh, destroying the reputation of good and decent people. We also realize that uh, not all men are honest, and uh, as such, we could be using this great uh, national forum to give scoundrels uh, an opportunity to uh, make self-serving statements. I think perhaps you've distinguished yourself up to this point as being one of the toughest and most incisive questioners. And in your questioning today, as in other days, you seem to be constantly trying to tie these lower downs with higher ups. Are you, are you satisfied with the progress of the hearings as far as cutting through to the, to the real heart of this problem? It's, it's not necessarily uh, tying the lower downs to the higher ups. Uh, now, some of these people have made statements, uh, admittedly, a uh, hearsay, uh, that somehow implicated the higher ups. Now, these are dangerous implications. I am concerned by the awful fact that uh, the president, for example, has been a judge guilty uh, by half of the people of the United States and all of us sitting here lawyers and uh, we want to abide with the principle that a man is presumed to be innocent until proven guilty and what I'm trying to do is to make certain that those who are testifying here are credible people this involves uh, the whole United States and I think uh, political parties the political process the governmental process is on, is on trial here. It's not Mr. Haldeman or Mr. Mitchell or the president. I think all of us are. As today's witness uh, testified, that he was of the impression that uh, this was the name of the game, that uh, we're all a bunch of crooks, and uh, stealing papers was, uh, well, done every day. Now, if this young man, apparently well-educated and from middle-class America takes that attitude. Imagine what others do. Senator Inouye, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, sir. So this national forum will continue next Tuesday with Herbert Porter back to finish his testimony before the committee investigation goes on to bigger but not necessarily better things. Assuming the immunity questions are resolved tomorrow in federal court, Jeb Magruder and possibly John Dean may go before the committee and the lights next week. And in the days and weeks to follow will come John Mitchell, Maurice Stans, and two men named Haldeman and Ehrlichman, among others. There is a momentum building, and I'm sure all of us who are following every word feel it. There may even be a desire, an impatience possibly, if you will, to get on to the big boys and their stories. But as we end this latest round of hearings, I'd like to put in a closing word tonight on behalf of the smaller shots, the little guys we've been hearing from, the Odles and the Reasoners, the Caulfields and the Sloans and the Porters of this world called Watergate. First place, it's easier to identify with, it, with them and their problems. Some of them have aroused sympathy, others anger and disgust, depending on the specifics of their actions. But they all have one thing in common, and that, of course, is their littleness. They were the spear carriers for the generals who mapped out this disgrace called Watergate. Spear carriers deserve their comeuppance as much as the generals. There's no question or dispute about that. But comeuppance is a matter of degree, as is power and authority, isn't it? All right, and while you ponder that deep question, let me thank all of you who have expressed yourself, either to us or to your local station, about our primetime coverage of the hearings. And we'll be back Tuesday night. Until then, I'm Jim Lara for Robert McNeil and Peter Kay, and for our guest, David Austin, thank you and good night.
From Washington, you've been watching gavel-to-gavel videotape coverage of hearings by the Senate Select Committee on Presidential Campaign Activities. This coverage is made possible by grants for special events coverage from the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and the Ford Foundation and has been a production of NPACT, a division of the Greater Washington Educational Telecommunications Association. Mm-hmm.